such as the fact they really loved enemas. Yeah, but you didn't expect that for number 10. The consumption of ethnogens in the Americas dates back to the Olmelic civilization, the earliest known Mesoamerican civilization. Evidently, this tradition was passed down and spread amongst many clans, with the consumption techniques evolving through generations. In the case of the Maya, well, they evidently understood the absorption processes of the lower digestive tract because that's where they like their entheogens and P actives and alcohol. And hilariously, this discovery is made through pottery. The first of these polychrome pottery jars was discovered in 1977 and several have been found since. Naturally, this became the subject of a landmark study in 1986 which analyzed the iconographic traditions of the Maya pottery pieces depicting the administration of enemas and compiled a list of possible substances the Maya may have ingested. Then to really drive it home, Peter, one of the paper's writers, decided to self-administer some Maya enema mix to a uh, test it out, and to quote him and his buddy who helped, the results certainly support the theoretical suggestion that alcohol is absorbed well from an enema. I can't believe two scientists owned up to getting ass drunk in a professional dialogue like their small town teens. But now that the prestigious IG Nobel Prize has been awarded in 2022 to the scholars that pioneered this Maya enema research oh so long ago, we can expect more research on this topic in the coming years, and likely more than a few researchers giving themselves multiple laced enemas for study purposes. And when the enema is done, well, put a cork in it, dude. We got some work to do. Number nine is obsidian dealers. The Mayas were cutting it up when it came to the obsidian game. Obsidian, which is also known as volcanic glass, was highly valued for its sharpness and durability back in the good old days. It also held deep cultural and historical significance in the Maya world. Naturally, Guatemala, which is renowned for its obsidian deposits, was a major mining and trading site for the Maya. Skilled craftsmen shaped obsidian into intricate tools, weapons, and household items and ceremonial artifacts. Through analysis of obsidian sources, researchers have traced an ancient networks and trade exchange routes that connected distant Maya territories. The Maya reverence for obsidian traveled as far as the product itself ended up doing, and it lingered even after the savage colonizers had laid siege to their advanced civilization, becoming a prize belonging in Europe shortly after the colonization of Central and South America in the mid 16th century. John Dee, the prominent Elizabethan era psychonaut, was an English astronomer and occultist who famously possessed a black obsidian scrying mirror which he believed allowed him to communicate with celestial beings. The specific detail of how and where he obtained the mirror are not extensively documented but it can be assumed to be Mexico or Guatemala. And while talking about obsidian, let's coagulate that with tools of the trade. Number 8. Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History has completed yet another season of excavation at the Maya city of Culuba in the first week of July 2023. This site has been a known archaeological treasure chest since its discovery, providing researchers with evidence pertaining to human sacrifice especially, which was a central component of ancient Maya culture. And wouldn't you know it, this season they discovered a sacrificial altar. The cubic stone bore all the hallmarks. They don't specify what hallmarks of an ancient sacrificial slab are, but I'd sure like to know. And it was further confirmed by the discovery of 16 sacrificial stone knives in the surrounding area, 13 of which are made with that Guatemalan obsidian. The sacrifice of animals and people, which would be prisoners or volunteers was conducted by high priests using altars like the ones discovered. Alfredo Pereira Rubio, a researcher at INAH, did elaborate that while the 16th sacrificial knives were unearthed at this altar, none had ever been used. These knives themselves were offerings specifically for the gods. And speaking of stones, still number 7 is how the Maya were rocking them tooth rocks. In the unique traditions, architecture, and aesthetic choices of the Maya amalgamated beautifully into an elaborate and architectural and artistic world, but it also played a huge role in how the Maya decorated themselves right down to every tooth and nail. It has been long assumed that the Maya tooth modification was only carried out for ritual purposes. However, a new study published in the Journal of Archaeological Sciences challenges that. See, this culture believed that their breath was a link to the divine, and so ritualistic purification of the mouth, or in modern terms, brushing your damn teeth, was incredibly common. In some cases, people also had teeth encrusted with gemstones, such as jade, iron pyrite, henna type, turquoise, cinnabar, etc. Turns out the sealants used for that were incredibly medicinal. In modern times we know pine resin attacks bacteria that causes plaque and eventual decay on teeth. Guess the Mayans did too. In the same way they seem to know about the salvia plant as a binding agent with antibacterial antifungal properties. 
I personally don't think I can stomach describing the process of tooth gem insertion in this video, but maybe sometime soon. However, Christina Verdugo, an anthropologist, says this new study finally addresses the long-standing question of how these stones were affixed. Furthermore, besides knowing the secrets of shaping and, and boring teeth, the study suggests Maya dentists also knew the secrets of avoiding post-operative infections. On to, you guessed it, more rocks. My favorite in the countdown by a landslide of precious stones, number six, Blood Jade and Dance. Dance is more than an action, motion, and a means by which to pass the time. It is connection with our ancestors, with the light and the dark and the being around us. The Maya, like indigenous colonies spread around the world, felt the beat of the earth's heart under their souls and used them to pound into the ground in response. By leaping and moving, they could bring themselves into a trance-like state that they would ascend into Wayabis, aka spirit companions. The Maya would often cut themselves with sharp spines, bones, and blades to release their blood before dancing, helping bring on those transcendental experiences through sheer exhaustion. And when making a divine connection, would you not be dressed to the nines? I'm talking masks, paint, feathers, wheat, all entangled and weaved into elaborate colors and patterns. And stone, heavy, heavy, heavy stone. Such as a five pound jade head pendant that had been found at Unicall, which would have once hung off the belt of a Mayan elite as he danced. And this Maya elite, like many others, would dance with an average of 25 pounds hanging off their body. The jade head pendant is more than just a belt piece as a result. The Maya had a concept they called kuk. Originally translated, it means burden. A kuk could be guilt, a physical weight, or in the case of these elites, responsibility, like the responsibility of public office. It was a way to remind him that he was not in his position as a freedom or as a luxury. Instead, he was there to serve his fellow Maya and carry the weight to their community. With every movement he made, he would have had a hard reminder that this was not just fun and games. And with every step of his foot, he would have felt the weight of that duty dragging him back down to the earth. All right, now on to number five, which will be the new ancient city. We have not had a break from rock since our first point, but guess what this city's name is? Utukumne. What's that mean in Mayan? Stone column. Don't think you escaped from the rocks. And speaking of escaping, that's exactly what this city did for a very long time. It went completely unnoticed until, thanks to the recent approval of airborne laser scanning on the central Mayan lowlands. After receiving LIDAR images showing man-made changes to the landscape, Ivan Spadach and his team thrashed their way through 60 kilometers of vegetation to reach this site. On the elevated terrain, they found a, several large buildings, including a number of pyramid-shaped ones measuring more than 15 meters. The cylindrical stone columns, which prompted the researchers to name the site Ulukumna, were probably entrances to rooms in the upper parts of the buildings. The team has also found altars, three plazas, and a ball court. Pottery unearthed at the site appears to indicate it was inhabited between 600 and 800 AD, a period known as Late Classic. But Sprach said the site probably underwent considerable changes between 800 and 1000 AD before falling victim to the collapse of the lowland Maya civilization in the 10th century. A mystery they're still hoping that the rediscovery of this lost Maya city can help unwind. Was it environmental degradation, political unrest, warfare, or the decline of trade networks? Number four is coming and he's a terror. The plight of gods, the destroyer of man. He is smoking frog, the conqueror. It really is an unenviable job to be the decipherer of Mayan script, which utilized logograms, symbols, and glyphs that were near impossible to comprehend. And hallelujah, someone recently figured out that the little pictures were in fact words. So the secrets of numerous surviving stelae and inscriptions from the many Maya ruins are finally coming into light, such as the events from the 14th of January, 378 AD. That was the day when a foreign warlord, Siya Kaka, conquered Tikal in the most powerful of all Mayan cities. He had been dubbed Smoking Frog because his glyph looked like a smoking frog. Sia's name actually means fire is born, and he was an exceptionally powerful man who hailed from Teotihuana. Oh, you know, just the most advanced Mesoamerican civilization that we know nothing about to this day, like their ethnicity, appearance, economics, or culture. Just poof, nothing in history. We do know it was a super city, however, which of course placed it in direct conflict with the equally powerful Maya civilization. So, from what historians can gather, the king of Teo set fire is born, who was either his brother or his right hand man, off to go F up the Maya Empire. Several recently discovered stelae helped scholars piece together the puzzle of Sia and the movements towards Tikal, mapping his path. Word must have traveled to Tikal of the invasion, and the forces met for a battle 16 miles from the city. This meant that an entirely new era was beginning in the metropolis, as all subsequently erected stelae would tell of Sia and his successors. This story truly is insane, but to dive into details would make it run long, so we'll stick a pin in that for now and move on to unraveling 
killing the Red Queen, which is number three. Archaeologists claim that only 10% of the ancient Maya city of Palenik has been explored so far. Among the ruins of Temple X111, where in 1994, Mexican archaeologist Arnaldo Gonzalez Cruz and his team made a legendary discovery, a tomb dating back to 600 or 700 AD. Excavations were being carried out at the temple to discover its construction sequence and the methods used in building it with no prior knowledge of burials there. Then they stumble upon what's starting to seem like a big old tomb, attention focused to cleaning its area, and they discover a small blocked up door on a second level of the temple plaza. When they remove the block, it reveals a long corridor leading to one of the best preserved galleries in discovered in Palenique to date. A few meters later, and there she was. The sarcophagus was a massive square of limestone, and inside was the remains of a noble woman and other objects painted and powdered with red cinnabar, earning her the name the Red Queen. This is the richest known burial for a female Maya leader. She has a headdress of green stone and shell, a collar of shell and bead, a diadem of apple green jade loops, and then there's the funerary mask, with obsidian eyes conveying a striking sense of the presence of a queen. Inside the sarcophagus, archaeologists also discover a seashell with a small limestone figure in it, which is pretty cute. Oh, and then there's also some guy buried in the chamber too, but it's assumed he's a servant sent to the afterlife to serve her. He's just Ken though, so back to Barbie. Researchers found that she lived between 600 and 700 AD, and while her name is nowhere found in the tomb, Gonzalez Cruz believes that she was Tizaki Awa, the wife of Pakal and the grandmother of the last Mayan king. The remains of the Red Queen were returned to Palenique in June of 2012. She couldn't be reburied in her original tomb due to the high humidity, so she's reburied in a different one close to the location of her ancient home. In July of 2018, her funerary finery, including the burial jewelry and the death mask, were restored by archaeologists and historians and put on display in Mexico City. Speaking of the dead, number two, the entrance to hell. When the meteor that destroyed the dinosaurs landed, it landed and hit the water near Hucanta. Sand there became porous, turning most of it into thick rock, but also giving it the ability to waste away with time and form sinkholes, aka senoids, which people like to swim in on vacation, and Mayas believed were literal access to hell. So, Gilmore de Anda's team spent five years looking at 450 year old historical records from the Spanish Inquisition to locate a series of sacred caves believed to be the hell passageway. The Spanish had been outraged at the Mayas continued practicing their old religion even after the persecution, so they used court trials to make them reveal the locations of the places where they performed ceremonies. That testimony leads De Anda to X on the map. Among De Anda's discoveries are broad, perfectly paved underground roads stretching 100 meters, a submerged temple, walled off stone rooms, and the confusing crossroads of legends. In one chamber it's impossible to move without slashing your skin, which is a representation of the Room of Knives. While Deanda has not yet encountered a specific jaguar chamber, jaguar bones have been found in at least one cave. Subterranean roads interrupted by deep pools of water may signify the rivers of blood and pus. Why go into the trouble of reproducing a hell? Perhaps it was a way to demonstrate power, Deanda said, or to give an idea of the terrors that they would meet en route to paradise. For now, Deanda's team is connecting tunnels and caves looking to uncover more. The most emotional for last, number one, will be They Burn Books, aka the July 12, 1562 tragedy at Mani. What can only be called a literal villain to history is a monstrous man named Friar Diego de Landa, whose act of faith at the city of Mani Yucanta is the most significant example of historic destruction or burning of the Maya books. Something he documented with excitement and pride in 1566 as he had removed the demons from indigenous hearts. Diego de Landa was among the first Francasins to arrive in Yucanta. He took the time to learn the language and mirrored cultural behaviors to start earning the trust of the 19 independent chieftains. This is the first time he sees Maya texts, which he interprets as idolatry and messages from the devil. In fact, they're written records of the indigenous communities, histories, crops, laws, land, and legends. It was around this time he decided to use physicality to force conversion. He persisted in eradicating traditional indigenous beliefs through extreme violence and torment, and encouraged the other friars and lay people to do so as well. Indigenous minds began to take their own lives in response. Then comes the day. It's July 15 1962 and two boys exploring find a hidden cave in Mani where a shrine and altar had been set up. They snitch to the friar who assembles a mob. People were burned in their thatched house, some flogged, many ran to take their own lives, and others were just killed. Then came the burning. The friar
fires under Diego's demands raid the homes that still stand. Their written records are stolen, as are their clary idols that hold the ashes of their ancestors. And in a bonfire facing the monastery, all were burned. Everything. These wooden clay representations of their ancestors filled with ash, their family documents and history, all integral to the descendants' inheritance. The foreign priests understood the significance of what they called superstition and idol tree when they burned these idols. By destroying these articles, they literally ripped people's identities away from them. They're standing in the community and they're titled to their land and property. The ancestral traditions lost lie at the roots of this tragedy, as does the history we will never regain. Despite an estimated 90% of Mayas dying from disease, war, and forced labor during the 16th century Spanish conquest, I want to make it clear, Maya people and culture has never disappeared. An estimated 6 million Maya people still live in Guatemala, Belize, the West Rondas, Salvador, and Southern Mexico alone. Starting our list off at number 10, the first skull. Before we get into some mysterious happenings in history, we have to talk about the very first Neanderthal skull that was ever discovered. The discovery came about back in 1829. The skull was found in a cave near Angus, Belgium. Now at the time, they didn't even realize it was the skull of a Neanderthal. That knowledge came much later, around 1856. And at that time, quarry workers were ripping apart limestone in a Fedhover cave near the German city Dusseldorf. But this skull was found in Neanderthal, a small valley of the Dussel River. Yeah. Hence, you know, the name, now we understand that. The skull was human, but it wasn't. This was game changing. Number nine, medicine. You can only imagine the various injuries Neanderthals would have, hunting down a mammoth or, you know, a bison three times the size of you. Odds are you're gonna get a bruise or two. So what did Neanderthals do at this point? Well, that's what this pile of bones is for. Yeah, it's so dark, right? How did Neanderthals live so long without a pharmacy? All that yelling, no halls, that's gonna hurt. Neanderthals' medical skills are pretty similar to what our ancestors did. Herbal remedies, baby, that's it, herbal remedies. They managed fevers, but when the pain got too bad, chewing on a specific tree may have helped tolerate the pain. So now we're looking back to these piles of bones, we find fragments of these leaves in their, you know, dental cavities. We could study their teeth and be like, mm, yes, I can see what you had for lunch. This makes sense. 40,000 years before penicillin, Neanderthals were chewing on aspirin. They were brilliant. Little dirty secret there. Number eight, ancient art. Okay, here's where we're at with Neanderthals and art. First of all, we don't have actual representational art, but we do have symbolism. That's pretty close and also just as fascinating in my opinion especially when they look like this. These are eagle talons, right? They're about 130,000 years old. They were found recently in the Krapina Neanderthal site in Croatia. Now researchers believe that they were part of a jewelry set like earrings or part of a necklace. I couldn't even make this now with the YouTube tutorial. You know what I mean? Yet somehow civilizations were crafting this thousands of years ago, 130,000 years ago, that's crazy. Number seven. The Indus River Valley Civilization. What's now modern Pakistan was one of the world's earliest societies ever. It was also referred to as the Harappan Civilization or the Indus. And they were actually quite large. We often hear about Vikings and how, you know, there were thousands of them or the 300 Spartan warriors. Well, the Indus were in the millions. Aside from the other earliest civilizations, Egyptians and Mesopotamians, they were considered the most extensive. The world's first ever dentists came from the Indus Valley. Something way more interesting than dentist facts is that when compared to Egyptian ancient cultures, the Indus never built any palaces or temples, right? Meaning there were probably no priests or kings. But we still get to study ancient texts. Those are always fun and often confusing. The Indus Valley civilization had a language that we're slowly but surely deciphering. But even so, there's around 200 to 50 to 500 characters that still remain a mystery, so. You know, we could figure out what these guys ate thousands of years ago, but we have no idea what they were saying. Signs be hard. Number six, Gobekli Tepe. Just six miles from the ancient Turkey city Urfa, Gobekli Tepe is 100,000 years old. And there are these massive stone circles created by a civilization that predates Stonehenge by 6,000 years. We're convinced it's the world's oldest temple, a holy temple rather. This area in the world, I mean now it may not be a spectacle, but thousands of years ago, you would be able to see the horizon in every direction from this point. You'd also see herds of beautiful animals racing by. There'd be fields of barley, wild wheat, it would have looked like a temple from the Legend of Zelda. It was gorgeous and the landscape was fresh. Mind you, because it was so long ago. It was discovered back in 1960s. University anthropologists, they were doing a survey of the region. They found this place and assumed that it was an ancient cemetery and nothing more, and then it continued on their merry way. Then cut to 1994, Klaus Schmidt was doing surveys for himself, 
found the same site and knew right away from the first glance that this was man-made. Oh, imagine that, imagine missing Gobekli Tepe the first time and being like, eh, the cemetery. Number five, Anasazi. Before the first skyscrapers were built in the 1880s, the Anasazi built massive stone buildings on the side of cliffs back in the 12th century. Some of these walls housed up to hundreds of residents, right? Like a skyscraper, a building, like a condo, just in the wall. What's now present day Mesa Verde National Park was pretty intense back in the earlier days. Scientists have uncovered some hints as to where these creative cliff builders disappeared to. Well, violence, that seems to be the common denominator here. Yeah, the thing that's still going strong today, well, thousands of years ago, back in the 12th century United States, long-term drought led to the Anasazi to violence, and perhaps they wiped out each other. Other theories suggest that the Anasazi had to abandon their massive homes around the 1300s and then travel south. Either way, these are so impressive to look at. Number four. Ancient Vikings. I'm a big Assassin's Creed fan. When they announced Vikings as their newest installment, I was pretty excited. Then I started playing it and I was like, yeah, that's not great. I'm a big Norse mythology fan, okay? But what actually happened to Greenland's Vikings? That's the mystery. Well, around 985 AD, Eric the Red arrived with a large fleet to colonize the island. And of course, was subsequently banished for manslaughter. So now we have two colonies on Greenland, a large Eastern colony and a smaller Western one. Now these Vikings didn't build massive pyramids, but instead they built stone churches that are still standing to this day. These Vikings were around for a few hundred years, and at one point in time, there were 5,000 Vikings, give or take. Now that's incredible, but later on in 1721, a missionary expedition arrived, and there were not 5,000 Vikings. In fact, there were no Vikings. Where did they go? Archaeologists did the digging and apparently the Western settlement died off around 1400 AD. And just decades later, the Eastern settlement was abandoned. Well, there's a handful of family fun movies that hint to what happened. The Ice Age, yeah. Well, the small one in the 14th century, at least, is the biggest factor on where these Vikings disappeared to. Yeah, just a small Ice Age, classic. That's uh, haunting for a Canadian to hear. Number three. Easter Island. Back between 300 and 1200 AD, Polynesians used canoes, not carnival cruise ships, canoes to somehow travel all the way to Easter Island, over 2,000 miles away from Chile. Yeah, that feat in itself is impressive, but when you start really thinking about the Easter Island heads on the actual island, it gets even more impressive. The Easter Island Moai statues, keep in mind there were hundreds, reach up to 32 feet high, and they weigh over 82 tons. It was a sight to see. That was until the 1800s. That's when the civilization suddenly vanished out of nowhere. Many of these statues were also destroyed during this time. The population as well was decreased drastically and the island's higher ups, be it priests or chiefs, whoever, were all overthrown. Well, whatever happened may give us some ideas for the future. Easter Islanders cut down so many trees that before their seeds could even enter the earth again, rats ate them. So these guys simply ran out of trees, which means they ran out of rope or the ability to make more canoes. So they were trapped. So naturally, a civil war began alongside starvation. Plus the arrival of Europeans in 1722, they immediately wiped out most of the remaining Easter Islanders. And then around the late 1800s, waves of smallpox reduced the amount of island natives to just 100. It was brutal. Number two, the Mississippians. We'll dial back the calendar now to 700 CE. Now at this point, before European colonization, the American Southeast was home to the Mississippians. Their main area was the city called Cahuikia, which is now modern day Collinsville, Illinois. And that's not large either, it's just six square miles. Now check out this photo of Monk's Mound, a now historic site. We look at ancient Egyptians and our jaws drop at the sight of those pyramids, plus their alignment with the stars that's obviously, of course, fascinating. Well, Kahuikia was once home to pyramids and large wooden structures as well. We're not exactly sure what happened to this 40,000 person civilization, but experts guess famine and disease were one of the many factors. And finally, number one. Clovis. Taking a look at some mammoth hunters for a last point here. Now this civilization is considered the first inhabitants of the new world. Pretty intense stuff. Hunters would use what's called Clovis points to get their next meal. They would use chipped flint and they had to hunt bison, mammoths, deer, anything that had skin to be used for shelter and or clothing. In fact, this 10,000 year old civilization may have disappeared at the same time as mammoths. 
After all, with these historical beasts acting as both your gear and your food, yeah, eating them ought to do some damage down the road. Not even an ice age was included yet, and already they're running out of resources. Number 10, A Tale of Two Flowers. The legend begins with two women, Expin, a perceived sinner, and the other woman, Utskolel, known as a good chaste woman. The wealthy townspeople look down at Expin and belittle her, as she was a woman of many love affairs. But they're ignorant of her good heart, as she cared for all those who were sick or poor and did so without expecting anything in return. Utskolel, meanwhile, all on her fancy rich girl virgin high horse, actually had a crap personality and a cold heart, considering everyone inferior to her. One day, the misunderstood Expin goes missing. The judgmental visitors think she's off pleasing more men, until they realize a pungent flower scent is radiating from her house. Nosy, they go check what the perfume is and find Expin dead. Flowers had fought their way through the floorboards to grow around her. The villagers are aghast, but Utskolal insists it's a demon's trick, and assures them when she herself dies, it'll smell even sweeter. Psych! When Utskolal dropped dead not long after, the villagers knew almost immediately because the stench radiating from her home was unbearable. Even flowers placed at her grave wilted and died the next day. As legend goes, Expin was reincarnated into the beautiful, sweet-smelling hedge flower. Utskalel, however, that uppity b-word got turned into a cactus flower that smelled like straight butt. Enraged that she was not as divine as she insisted she had been in life, Utskalel called upon the spirits to make her a woman again, wanting to find love affairs as Expin had, assuming her power came from them. But Utskalel's heart could only be evil, and there Therefore, the spirits could only turn her into a half-woman, half-demonic spirit whose name I won't say. Now she wanders, wearing a white dress with large black eyes, and lurks near trees and hedges at night seeking out men. She'll have intercourse with them before taking the form of a poisonous snake and devouring them, or ripping their hearts from their chests before throwing them from cliffs. Pretty hardcore stuff, right? Well, get ready for number nine then, the story of the man-goat. I'm going to only say its true name once for context, after that it's all abbreviations, baby. So, the Hue Shivo is a half-man that transforms himself as at will and only during the nighttime. Said to have glowing red eyes, thick black but patchy fur, and stands on two hoven animal legs. Despite this, it will have the torso and arms of a human and the head of a goat. If the HC is near, you will smell rotting flesh and feel a wave of cold air. If you do see an HC, you must look away. This creature can be created by a sorcerer, but its origin story is as follows. A handsome man lived in Manada, working hard and he was well educated. However, he was poor, too poor to marry his beloved of a high social class. So he took out to the jungle, screaming his pain out, and in rage called upon the king of the underworld. The king appears, asking what he can provide this distraught man, who begs to sell his soul for a chance to be near the young woman, anything to be with her. The underworld king is like, Sh anything? Say less! And turn the man into a goat, kinda. The young man is hysterical, saying this is not what he wanted, that he's neither man nor goat, but a monster. The underworld king laughs at him and says he did his part, gave the man what he wanted, and leaves. Since since then, the HC runs through the night, killing farm animals in a rage for having been tricked into becoming half of one himself. Let's have a palate cleanser, something a little more tame for number eight. How about the farmer and the tree? Trees came to earth with a mission. Some cure diseases, others provide wood for building shelter. Some produce food for many creatures. Humans knew this once, but as time went on, man became forgetful and began felling the forest with little regard for the tree's purposes and lives. There was one tree, once the happiest on earth, that watched all this deforestation and destruction and became incredibly depressed, watching the destruction grow closer. Finally, the logging reached his part of the jungle and a farmer came, ready to put his ax through him. As the farmer swung, the tree found its voice and screamed out, not me, in fear. The farmer freezes alarmed and stares in awe at the great tree, asking if it's true that it had just spoken. We can, the tree replied. My name is Sirikote. Trees are the connection between the heavens, the earth, and the underworld, and we can talk in times of desperate need. Why didn't the other trees say anything when I came to cut them down, the farmer asked confused. I don't mean any harm, but we need the land to grow food. Their mission was different, explained Sirikote. Their purpose was to gift their wood, but mine is not. You can plant your crops, but keep me around, and soon enough you will learn why. The farmer hesitant did as he was told. Patient, he tended to the plot and took care of the tree, and the tree grew tall and its foliage wide. And when the time came, it produced delicious fruits that fed the farmer's family and the animals that lived around. 
Number seven is the story of the rabbit and the shoe. Long ago, animals lived together in harmony in a single mountain cave. Each animal had its own burrow, the coyote, the vulture, the deer, the lion, the snake, and so on. However, they were all tired of being tricked by the rabbit. There was nothing to do but call a meeting and decide together what to do, which they all agreed was to roll a boulder onto the rabbit and smash it to pieces. The lion says, you, turkey vulture, go watch for him to come out, and you, deer, go right after him. Since you can run as fast as may a rabbit, you'll be able to catch up with him. Be on guard, all of you. Snake, you look to see when he comes out and we'll all pile on top of him. You, snake, call him. The animals all agreed to the plan, keeping an eye on the rabbit hole where he was presumably asleep, but the rabbit wasn't and had heard their plot. So when they begin to call out, rabbit, come on out, hurry. The rabbit's only response is, wait, I'm taking off my sandal. But hurry, said the snake. Wait for me there, I'm coming out, called back the rabbit. A moment passes. All right, said the rabbit, I'm coming out now, but please catch my other sandal, I beg you, so I may put it on outside. The other animals mutter amongst themselves and agree to catch his sandal and throw it over there. Then shout to the rabbit, all right, mayor, throw out your sandal. The turkey vulture caught the sandal. He gave it to the deer and the deer threw it away. They were all too busy shouting at the rabbit's hole to realize it wasn't his sandal they had tossed away, but the rabbit himself. Finally, they send the snake into the hole in the raft, and the snake shouts, he's not here, he's not here. He's not here, maybe it was him we threw, said the lion. Did you notice if it was his sandal you threw away? He asked the deer angrily. The animals begin to fight amongst themselves and begin to kill one another in a raid. Meanwhile, the rabbit from far away laughed at their bloodshed and the lie and lives to be the trickster to this day. Number six is the story of the turtle baby. Long ago, there lived a very old woman, the oracle of an ancient Mayan world. But alas, the price for her rule was her fertility and the woman craved motherhood in her old age. One day, the fertility god Chikan appears and tells her to visit her local synoids every day in search of a very large turtle egg. The oracle did until one day she found the egg and brought it home, from which emerged a tiny green dwarf with bright copper hair. The oracle treasured the strange son and raised him with love until he was a man. But he was a curious one and one day approached the cauldron his mother forbid him from. Inside was a gourd rattle, one so loud and powerful the oracle herself made a prophecy that should it be played, a new king was to be crowned and guess who played it? The king, as does the whole kingdom, hears this rattle and is immediately enraged. Hunting down the sun, he demands he face three tests. The first was to build a long white road, which the sun does with the help of the gods. The second test was for the sun to build the tallest building in the land overnight, otherwise be killed. The sun, unsure of what to do, lays on the earth to contemplate, but when he wakes, it's on top of the largest pyramid in the land, built for him once again by the gods. For the third and final test, the king asked the sun to place a hickory on his head and then break it with a spearhead. The dwarf passed this test because he had a hardened plate the oracle mother had wished upon his head as a babe. The king, however, did not have a hard head, and trying the challenge himself, dies. Thus the sun has declared the king. How about we learn of another creature for number five? It's the Sisimite. That's my one name job. I'm gonna be calling it Sis from here on out, even if it doesn't exactly suit the visual aesthetic of a horrifying, deformed Bigfoot. That's essentially what this creature is, a shaggy six to eight foot tall Mesoamerican monster with only four fingers and no thumbs. Backward facing feet, and no knees. Its face is ape-like with teeth of a jaguar and it can only communicate through howling screams. As a result, the cis craves to gain the power of speech like humans. Ellen Danien, the curator of Painted Metaphors, wrote, if a woman sees a cis, her life is indefinitely prolonged. But if a man never lives more than a month after he's looked into the eyes of the monster. That doesn't mean women are safe, however. It's said that cis targets and steals human women, and should she not fall in love with the cis, the woman will inevitably be devoured. But if tall, dark, and hairy with no knees is your type, he may grant you magical powers for loving him. Don't worry, if you come across a cis, there's a laundry list of things you can do to protect yourself, such as dance in a circle since it'll trip over itself, or just bring a dog or water to splash on it. Concerned with good and evil dualities, this legend tells the story of two warrior trees. Number four. The brothers' names were Kinch, who was gentle and noble, and Kisik, who was arrogant and ruthless. One day, they met Nikteha, a beautiful and intelligent princess who conquered the hearts of both men. Both fell instantly in love and vied for the woman, but obviously only one could have her, so Tisik challenged his brother to a duel to the death. This decision angered the gods, who covered the sky in thick clouds and hid the moon from sight as the two fought. But there was no winner. Both fighters are mortally injured by the other and collapsed to the ground. You may be wondering, would it have been easier to ask Nikteha if who she wanted to have in the first place? 
Probably, but she may have not wanted either for all they know, as neither had ever asked. And now they're dead. Desperate to see her again, and full of regret for the death of each other, the two brothers asked the gods to return to Earth once more. The gods accepted, but warned the brothers could only come back as trees. Now you can see the warrior siblings in the jungle in the form of the Chichen and Chaka trees. The first evil still in an arboreal reincarnation oozes a highly irritating toxin, meanwhile the Chaka, the good guy, produces a soothing sage that acts as an antidote. These two trees only ever grow next to one another. Number three will be the story of the jaguar and the skunk. Once there was a jaguar and then Miss Skunk. Miss Skunk had a son blessed by the jaguar who the jaguar visits one day, telling Miss Skunk it's time to teach the boy to hunt. Miss Skunk tries to argue that the distance is too far and the task too dangerous. What if something was to happen and she can't make it in time? But little Skunk insists on going and leaves with jaguar for the riverbed. The two came upon the river and the jaguar states this is where they were to eat and that he must sharpen his knives, referring to his claws. After doing so, he tells little Skunk, now you're going to be on guard because I am going to be asleep. When you see them come, wake me up. Don't shout. Scratch my belly so I won't alarm them. But don't wake me up if it's just any old little animal without antlers coming along. Only when the big antlers get here. Little Skunk agrees and sits on guard for his godfather Jaguar as he sleeps until one with big antlers comes. Little Skunk does as instructed and Jaguar takes the animal down. Together the two eat and bring the rest of the carcass back to Miss Skunk who has her fill and stores the rest as Jaguar leaves. Time goes by and the meat is once again deplenished. Little Skunk decides he must go hunting, but without calling Jaguar. His mother begs otherwise, but cannot stop him. Little Skunk mimics the actions of Jaguar. He sharpens his little claws and waits on the riverbed, deciding like Jaguar to hunt the large animals, not the little ones his own size, and sleeps until he is awakened by the trot of the big antlered animal. Little Skunk attacks, thinking he's as strong and big as his godfather, only to hang from the neck of the steed with his claws until suddenly thrown off. Little Skunk lands on his back, mouth left wide open in surprise, and Miss Skunk begins to worry. Why hadn't her son come back yet. Where was he? She decides to go look for him and sees the trotted path the antler creature made and begins to cry following it, where she finally sees her son. Miss Skunk sees little Skunk's open mouth and relieved says, son, what are you laughing at? All your teeth are showing. She approaches closer telling her son, give me your hand. I've come to get you, but you're just laughing in my face. But as mother Skunk lays her hand upon him, thinking he is alive, she notices little Skunk was long since dead and begins to cry once more. Can you decipher the meaning of this story? Comment below. Number two is literally the stuff of my nightmares, it's the LP. They are what I am, a person, but smaller. That's the only way I can say it without saying it, but it's super easy to devise. These creatures live in the Yucatan Peninsula, but in many other indigenous lands, such as right here in North America, which is why I'm not taking any risks. Typically invisible to humans, they were capable of becoming visible when they want, but are typically found in natural areas, including jungles, forests, fields, and caves. When visible, the LPs are only knee high and have wide owl-like reddish eyes. They're also quick in their movements, destroying their surroundings. If someone was having a string of significant bad luck, it is believed that they must have done something to displease or become cursed with one of these LPs. You can rid of them by calling on ancestral protection or even providing offerings like shelter, food, or tobacco. But LPs aren't only known for their chaos. If handled and approaches correctly, they can be good luck for farmlands. Many farmers have proudly turned to the LPs for decades and help keeping their farms safe. However, as stated, locals and visitors alike should avoid calling the LP by any of its names since it may summon it to you and cause a bout of immediate torment as a revenge. Alrighty, last on the list, number one is how the bird king was chosen. Maya land was looked upon by Halak Yunik, the great spirit. His will was law, and after growing tired of the constant fights amongst the birds, he gathered them at the center of the jungle and announced a king must be chosen. Of course, every bird felt it possessed the best qualifications. Kolpulche, the cardinal, says no one else is as bright red and so beautiful as he struts. Hekolpulche, the mockingbird, trills that they are the only bird with such a lovely voice and that everyone should listen to them. To prove his point, he trilled out an enrapturing song, one that the wild turkey interrupts with a gobble, stating, there's no doubt I should be king because I'm the biggest and strongest bird. I can stop fights and defend any of you. The birds continue to display their grandeur, while in the background, Kukul, the Quetzal, remained quiet. Elegant in manners and figure, but plumage shabby. Kukul knew he would be the best king, but he wouldn't be chosen if dressed so poorly, so he approached the roadrunner, a trusted friend, and asked for his feathers, offering to share wealth and honors with him in return. When the roadrunner finally agrees, one by one, his feathers disappear, joining the plumage of the Kukal, whose body now shimmered an iridescent hue of blues and greens, his breast the color of tropical sunset, and the four-foot feather tail followed behind his dainty walk. Kukul had become the peacock, and his visage awarded him the role of king. The birds return to their respective homes and Kukal to his new duties, but the peacock becomes too busy and forgets his promise to the roadrunner. A group of birds soon seek out the missing roadrunner to find him naked and nearly dead from the cold. Together the birds give him honey 
and each take feathers from their own plumage to give to him. The Roadrunner told his friends of the cruel deception of Kakul and kept repeating, where is he, where is he? Which in Maya sounds like pahoy, pahoy, the call of a Roadrunner. And that's why today the Roadrunner's feather remains so oddly colored and patchy and patterned. The bird always watching the Maya roads, searching for the Quetzal that stole his plumage, shouting out pahoy, pahoy, as he searches. Coming in at number 10, Nineveh. The Nineveh civilization was one of the oldest and most impressive civilizations of the ancient world. Located in what is now modern day Mosul in Iraq, this civilization thrived mostly under the rule of King Sennacherib from 704 BC to 681 BC. Under his leadership, Nineveh was made the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Their kingdom was massive and had a lot of impressive infrastructure like a 15 gate wall around the city as well as parks, aqueducts, canals and an 80 room palace. This place was so extravagant that some scholars today believe that the famous hanging gardens of Babylon were actually located in Nineveh and were commissioned by King Sennacherib. Other than their infrastructure, their culture was also incredibly impressive as well. Nineveh was known as a center for the development of arts, sciences and architecture and scribes and scholars from elsewhere would flock to Nineveh to further their studies. They had a library that contained over 30,000 inscribed clay tablets and one of those tablets included a story of a great flood that drowned the world except for one man who survived by building a boat and searching for dry land. Does that story sound familiar? It might since it's an early version of the story of Noah's Ark. This version of the story though was inscribed a thousand years before it ever reached Hebrew text. Now even though this was a large and powerful civilization, all good things must come to an end and they met their end after a royal feud led to the breakup and this led to the joint forces of Persians, Babylonians and others in the area to burning Nineveh to the ground. Number 9. The Mesopotamian Civilization Next up we have the first civilization ever recorded in history. Their origins date back to as early as 500 BC in what's now Iraq, Syria and Turkey. Mesopotamia is a staple in history. It's actually the first society that developed agriculture and its name translates to between rivers or land between rivers. It was a perfect spot to domesticate animals for farming and for food. The oldest wheel ever was found in southern Mesopotamian city of Ur. They invented the wheel, cursive writing, and something even more important than all, they invented beer. The oldest recipe for beer comes from Mesopotamia. Wheels, poems, beer, this sounds like the world's oldest, and dare I say it, best party. Of course, aliens also come into play too when looking back at Mesopotamian culture. They had an advanced understanding of the cosmos using astronomical instruments. Now, one of these instruments was this Venus tablet of Amasadaka, which could predict these astronomical events. Maybe our earliest civilization made contact and now they're just trying to reach out. Can you get ghosted over a tablet? Probably. I number eight, Vinca. We're throwing it all the way back to the Neolithic period because we're talking about the Vinca civilization. Vinca is known as the oldest Neolithic civilization in Europe. These guys were establishing their own civilization in the Stone Age long before civilizations like Egypt and Mesopotamia. Though we don't know all that much about them, we do know that they had one of the earliest writing systems in the world. Researchers have discovered around 700 characters that are believed to have been their way of forming written sentences, though this is all just a theory for now since these characters have yet to be translated. The archaeological evidence that had been found from the Vinca civilization suggests that this group of people thrived in the area along the banks of the Danube River for more than a thousand years before being abandoned. No one really knows why the Vinca civilization abandoned the area or where they went, but maybe one day we will get those answers. Number 7. The Mayans it's 2021, which means the world thankfully didn't end in 2012. But that movie was good. Kind of, not really. But the Mayan calendar did predict that on December 21st, 2012, this would be the end of us. No meteors hit and Thanos didn't snap away any of us, but that date did mark the end of their 5,125 year long count calendar. Yeah, and you thought you were a planner. These guys were crazy. One of the earliest uses of the number zero being in mathematics came from the Mayans. They were super advanced for their time, and they were also quite artistic. They drew complex hieroglyphs on long strips of paper made from fig tree bark. I can't write four sentences down on paper without my wrist hurting. I have to like slap it around for a minute. These guys are on a whole new level. These stories date all the way back to the late pre-classic period, so around 300 BCE. That is so old. The Olmecs of Mesoamerica figured out how to consume chocolate, sure, but like the art that we see etched into the stone walls around them, the Mayans made it beautiful. The Mayans would mix chocolate with water and chili peppers and honey. They would make it as a spicy drink. I'm gonna stick with the old pumpkin spice for now. I think that's the riskiest I'll go. Thanks so much though. Debit. At number six, Mehergar. 
Even though Mehrgar was a pretty impressive civilization, no one really knows about it because very little interest was invested in learning more about it. Mehrgar was one of the oldest civilizations in the world, situated in what is now modern day Pakistan. Excavations of the site started back in the 1970s, but due to the government's lack of interest, looting, and land erosion, it made it hard to learn much about this ancient settlement. From evidence that has been gathered, we do know that Mehrgar had a population of around 25,000 people, and based on some of the remains recovered from this ancient civilization, there was evidence of dental surgery which as you can imagine isn't really something you see very often, especially at the time that this civilization existed. Other than that, many of the other secrets of the civilization are buried very deep in the earth so it makes it much harder for researchers to uncover them. What has been found though are some pretty well preserved buildings made from brick and even a formal cemetery. Who knows what else we might learn from this site. Number 5. Rapa Nui also referred to as the Easter Islanders, the Rapa Nui is known most famously for their Easter Island heads, the Moai, that still to this day reach up to 13 feet tall and weigh over 80 tons. Massive achievements. Now how did they build these things and also how did they move them around? Well there's of course a crazy alien theory and it's my favorite theory of all. The indigenous Rapa Nui claim that these statues once roamed the land like night at the museum but with you know less bubblegum and fun. There were once thousands of these sculptures but during the 1700s civil wars was resulted in the Rapa Nui tearing them all apart. It was already an impressive feat building the Moai, but in 1914, archaeologists discovered they also had bodies beneath them. Just like us YouTubers, you never know underneath here. We could be 7 feet tall or we could be 5 feet tall, you really don't know. Look at this, you have no idea. The theory that all these statues would move around seems a little bit more plausible now that we know that. At number 4, Nubia. The ancient civilization of Nubia was almost like ancient Egypt adjacent until it wasn't. Nubia was located south of Egypt and Sudan, and at one point they even ruled Egypt. Nubia even had their own pyramids, and over 200 of them still remain today. The period that the Nubians ruled over Egypt was known as Egypt's 25th dynasty, or the Black Dynasty, because of the dark skin of the Nubian pharaohs, and this time was known for its stability and prosperity, with a lot of their emphasis being on arts and culture of the people. This civilization had their own written language and rich culture, and they were also very wealthy as they were situated on a literal gold mine. They continued to thrive until an Egyptian pharaoh raided Nubia and turned it into a mineral extraction outpost. Rather than Nubia rule over Egypt, the tables turned and the roles were reversed, making Nubia an underling of Egypt. Eventually the Nubian people just assimilated into the Egyptian population and Nubia just died off over time. Number 3. The Incas their city is currently a wonder of the modern world. Machu Picchu was built over 500 years ago. It was once known as the lost city of the Inca, and it's absolutely beautiful. It was first discovered in 1911 by archaeologist Hiram Bingham when he and a small team were originally heading out to find the ancient city of Vilcabamba, but instead they found this landmark. The stones used to build the city were even heavier than they already look. We look at Stonehenge in disbelief right now, wondering how humans were able to lift those rocks. But look at this place. These stones each weighed over 50 tons, and with Machu Picchu literally translating to old mountain, those hills certainly don't look easy to climb. I complained about doing two trips carrying groceries. My back hurts just looking at this thing. The Inca were impressive builders. The city is designed perfectly. I mean, evidently. After 500 years of earthquakes and horrible weather, it's wild that the city is still in the shape that it's in. Elongated skulls were also found on the site by archaeologists, and many believe that it's aliens thanks to pop culture, but elongated skulls were actually a sign of royalty in the Incas. It's no surprise Machu Picchu is the most visited place in Peru. You just might want to take your trail shoes when you head over there. At number 2, Norte Chico Civilization. The story of the Norte Chico Civilization is fascinating, yet also shrouded in mystery. Overall, very little is known about the Norte Chico Civilization, but it is believed that this pre-Columbian society is one of the oldest known civilization in the Americas. Researchers know more about this civilization's infrastructure than the way that the people lived. We know that they had huge buildings like pyramids and complex irrigation systems, but what makes this so bizarre is the fact that there's no evidence of any pottery in the civilization which suggests that they don't know how to use it. How are you going to build a whole pyramid but struggle to make a pot? I don't get it. There is also evidence that these people worship some kind of deity, but again, no one knows what form this deity took. 
Now here's where the mystery really comes in. No one knows what happened to the Norte Chico civilization. The settlements were abandoned sometime around 1800 BC, but no one really knows why. There's no evidence of any kind of warfare and there were no natural disasters to cause them to flee their homes. The people just kind of disappeared and no one has been able to piece together the puzzle, so we may never know. And coming in at number one, the Greek civilization. The Antikythera mechanism is the world's oldest analog computer. It would keep track of the cosmos and to this day we're trying to figure out the exact purpose of it or how it was built. But what we do know is that one of those dials in there was meant to keep track of the Olympics. That's how important this event was. Thanks to the ancient Greeks, now we get to see dudes hucking shock puts at people. It's great. The ancient Greek civilization thrived in Greece around 500 BC to 2700 BC. The rich history of ancient Greeks spans such a long time that we've divided their time into periods, like the Archaic, Hellenistic, and Classical period. Their wine was so good that they had a wine god in the pantheon. God Dionysus. What an OG. It was deemed a hubris for Greeks to get intoxicated so they would also add water to their wine. That way they could keep the party going all night, of course, but actually it was done so nobody became violent. Only God Dionysus would drink wine straight out. That's pretty, pretty hardcore. If inventing the Olympics wasn't badass enough, they also used stones instead of toilet paper. So I'll let you imagine that in your head. We'll leave on that note. That's a nice pretty image to finish on. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Those were just 10 extinct civilizations that you've never heard of. But before you go, leave a comment or two or three or four telling us which of these civilizations sounded the most intense. Yeah, I'll be honest, the whole wiping with rock things, I haven't really gotten over that. Yeah, no, I think I'm a little scarred for life. <laughs> I think I'd rather use poison ivy at that point. We'll see. Anything is better. Yeah. Literally anything is better. Just, 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 just leave it. Just, just walk it. away. Just literally, <laughs> eh, I'm fine. I don't need it. I'll just put my jeans on and go on with life. That's a weird note to finish on, but we're gonna do it. Kicking off the list at number 10, astronomy. You ever wanna date somebody, but they're a Libra and you're a Gemini? Oh, ain't that the worst? Look, dating apps even have this now as a feature. You can write down what your symbol is, like, hi, I'm Kyle, I'm a Leo, and I love waking up early. Those are real bios for real people, and we have the Mayans to thank for all of this. The Maya studied the stars. They were the pioneers of our calendar, which I'll explain a little bit later on, but they also created lunar months. They figured that 81 lunar months added up to 2,392 days, meaning that one lunar month is 29.53 days, incredibly close to our modern moon month, which is crazy. They nailed it that long ago. They also studied Jupiter, Mars, and Mercury. They studied where each planet travels to and when. If you're a Libra, like me, smash that thumbs up. I'm a late Libra too. We're just trouble. We're the worst of the worst. Number nine, the Mayan calendar. It's 2022, which means the world thankfully did not end in 2012, but the Mayan calendar predicted that on December 21st, 2012, apparently it would be this massive doomsday. No, no meteors hit. That was all false. That wasn't a real thing. Thanos didn't snap any of us away. Nothing like that happened. But that day did mark the end of their 5,125 year long count calendar. Yeah, and you thought you were a planner, okay. The Mayan calendar is extremely accurate. Their calendar is 10 thousands of a day more exact than the calendar that the world uses today. They're that precise. We have leap years and stuff just to try and correct it. They used 20 day months and had two calendar years. They had a 260 day sacred round and then a 365 day year. Every 52 years, these two calendars would coincide with one another and this was referred to as a bundle. Imagine if we still had this now, that'd be so confusing. But 10, Nine, eight, what are we saying? Seven. Number eight, chocolate. When I visited the UK, the, the first thing I noticed was how much better your chocolate was. So good. I'm not sure what y'all are doing over there. Maybe it's just made with love. Who knows? But I'm a huge chocolate guy and the UK nails it. Yeah, wash it down with some iron brew. Buddy, what a day, what a great day. The Mayans as well, turns out they loved chocolate. The old Mex of Mesoamerica figured out how to consume chocolate, but the Mayans made it beautiful. They added some spice to it, literally. The Mayans would mix chocolate with water, chili peppers, and honey. They would make a spicy drink. Are you into this idea? Is this making your lips happy right now? Spicy chocolate drinks? My tummy can barely handle a pumpkin spice latte, let alone a Mayan milkshake. No, thank you. Number seven. Math. One of the earliest uses of the number zero, being in mathematics, came from the Mayans. Thanks, awesome. They were super advanced in their mathematics, I would say for their time, but no, in general they were advanced. We're still trying to understand how they achieved what they did without calculators, it's impressive. They drew complex hieroglyphs on long strips of paper made from fig tree bark. They didn't have much to work with here, yet somehow it was still enough. 
The Maya numerical system only had three symbols. This was long before Betmaz was born. They had zero, one, and five. That's it, you could literally count on one hand. There's a shell shape, a dab, and a bar. These numbers went from zero to 19, and then they would count groups of 20. By the time 36 BC rolled around, the Maya were introducing the concept of zero into their numbering system. Thanks guys, I failed math twice because of those zeros. Cheers. Number six, glyphs. Glyphs at number six, six glyphs. One of the most advanced forms of writing when it comes to all these ancient Americans, the Maya were the most ahead of their time. They invented the glyph, which are these symbols that represent a word or a sound. Like anything else in this civilization, it's beautiful to look at, of course. The Maya used around 700 different glyphs. They're detailed, they're beautiful. A good amount we're able to translate today, but there's still a mysterious chunk that we're trying to figure out. The earliest glyphs engravings go back to the third century BC, meaning that the Maya are the pioneers of writing in Mesoamerica. There are only a few civilizations where writing naturally occurred. The Mayans, ancient Chinese, and the ancient Mesopotamians. Number five, rubber. Rubber is a fundamental. I mean, sure, the long-term effects for rubber are questionable in turn. Now we have literal pits full of tires, but where did it all begin and why? The Maya created art, they looked to the stars and made calendars, but what did they do when they wanted to have a good time? Mayan meals were composed of maize, squash, and beans with tons of crops. Turns out the Maya were the ones who created elastic long before Mr. Goodyear over here. They made elastic from latex by mixing it with other plants. They really created bouncy balls, if anything. They took latex from trees and mixed it with vine juice. This was around 1600 BC, and you can't invent rubber balls without creating some. Number four. Ball games. Yeah, imagine inventing a bouncy ball. You can now create any game you want, any rules. You'll never lose again. How great is that? The Maya have pretty impressive ball courts. These games were all but fun, honestly. These were religious events. These games would last around 20 days on average, so I hope you warmed up that harm because you're gonna be here for a while. The pressure was always on also from the overlords as these courts were built at the bottom of a sanctuary. Yeah, hey, no pressure, but uh, your ex is here with Zeus. Break a leg. The go-to game was called pocket talk or hodgepodge, and you had to throw a heavy elastic ball through a hoop. Instead of fist bumping at the end of the day saying good game, good game, good game, the losing side would either one, not survive, dark, or they would have to give over all of their belongings, which also sucks. Yeah, a 20 day game, and then you'd lose all your stuff. That's horrible, what a horrible month. Number three, art. Of course we have to mention art. I'm not saying the Mayans invented art by any means. Each of these ancient civilizations had their own way of expressing the afterlife or life in general. Art was just everywhere. The Mayans specialized in decorating stone landmarks. There's only a handful of woodcut art pieces, but the most popular are these stone pieces from Copan and Carigua. They're extremely complex as well, obviously. Look at these. Rock climbers couldn't even get their fingers in these greaves, you know what I mean? Like, that's crazy, yet somehow people made them. These zoomorphs here are giant rock sculptures created in the shape of animals, which are always fun. And of course, the Mayans are also famous for their wall paintings dating back to 200 BC. One of the most well-preserved is at Bonampak. Look at this, this is incredible. We often look at Egyptians and their art, but this is incredible too, often overlooked. Number two. Laws. The Maya made their own ball games. They made their own rules. They made chocolate their own way. But they also created law and order. In a time where food and shelter was sparse, you would think it would be a lot like the Dark Ages. Just a bloody mess, you know, full of thieves and bodies and bad stuff everywhere. Well, when you're the first civilization to create the death penalty, everybody is pretty well behaved afterwards. More than fair, yeah, fair. Taking the life of others was uncommon because of these harsh laws. I mean, you remember how those ball games would end, right? Yeah, imagine crimes. If you were to take the life of another, say you lost a ball game, all your goods are now gone, you react in a horrible way, well, who comes knocking at your door asking questions? Who says you're now a suspect? Sherlock Holmes? No. Say you live with somebody and they commit a crime. Well, not only are they now gone after they get caught, but the victim also gets your land. They get all your goods, cattle, your home, everything. So whoever lives with you as well, well, you better pack your rubber balls. You're out of here. You don't live here anymore, thanks to Good Game Gordo over here. I'm glad certain things stuck around, like the law and order part, but uh, imagine being evicted because your roommate stole some beans. God damn it, Craig. Don't do that. And finally, number one, the underworld. Also referred to as the place of fright. Okay, save the best for last, we love it. Zibalba comes from Mayan mythology. Overseen, of course, by the Mayan death gods, Zibalba came to be in the 16th century Verapaz. The entrance to such a wonderful place was in the cave of Guatemala. So, splunkers beware if you're putting that on your agenda. Maybe avoid this one. Caves in Belize are actually known as the entrance to Zibalba, these water-filled caves again, and they span as far as 300 feet. That's a massive, evil front door you want to 
the void right there. But you can't just grab a snorkel and frog kick your way to the underworld. It's not that easy. According to ancient Maya scripture, the Popol Vu, this path once filled with dark obstacles, and when I say dark obstacles, I mean dark. I'm talking a river filled with scorpions and blood combined with houses littered with bats and pure darkness. It's not easy to get through. It's like those haunted houses in Niagara Falls. It's really scary. This is why you don't cheat in Mayan ball games. You end up here. Do you want to be here? No. In fact, if you cheat in Monopoly, I believe you also end up here. Yeah, I'm talking to you, Stacy. Don't cheat. Number 10. Corral. The sacred city of Corral is an archaeological site considered to be one of the oldest known civilizations in the Americas. The formation of the civilization took place around 3500 BCE and ran to about 1800 BCE. No other site has been found with such a diversity of buildings and architecture and has since been declared a humanity cultural heritage site by UNESCO themselves. Uncovered around 1905, Peruvian archaeologists provided the first documentation on the civilization at Corral. They appear to have an economy of some sort, selling mostly textiles and fish. The civilization is considered a pre-ceramic culture, since archaeologists have yet to find any sculpted or painted art. However, they did find a system of writing called Quipu, which is a string-based recording device suggesting a proto-writing of some sort. They were widely known for their architecture of huge earth-landscaped projects of mounds, particularly a massive labyrinth of underground circular connecting plazas. They were ahead of their time. Yeah. Number 9. The Etruscans Side note, if you dig what we do here on Bumblebee, make sure to Hulk smash that like button for us, huh? The Etruscan civilization was a people of Etruria in ancient Italy. They had a common language, culture, and formed a federation of cities. Their territory covered now what is Tuscany, Umbria, and Lazio. The earliest evidence of this culture is from about 900 BC. This is the period of the Iron Age considered to be the earliest phase of Etruscan civilization. With a maximum population peaking around 750 BC, the earliest examples of writing are inscriptions found around 700 BC. They developed a system of writing derived from the Euboean alphabet. The language remains only partly understood, making modern understanding of their society and culture heavily dependent on later Roman and Greek sources. Number 8. Inca. The Incan Empire was the largest of pre-Columbian America. The center of the empire was the city of Cusco. The Incans arose from the Peruvian highlands in the late 12th century. The Spanish began their conquest of the empire in 1532 and by 1572, the last Inca state was fully conquered. Before they fell, the Incas were able to construct one of the greatest imperial states in history, accidentally. Without the use of a wheel, knowledge of iron or steel, or even a system of reading and writing. Yeah, these guys were good. About all 14 million of them as well. The empire included construction of monumental architecture, stone and roadwork reaching to all corners of the empire, and even finely woven textiles. They functioned without money and without markets. Instead, exchange of goods and services was based on individuals, groups, and rulers. Taxes consisted of a labor obligation, usually construction. Everyone was either lifting or carving, you know? The Inca rulers would even grant access to land goods and celebratory feasts for the workers if you did a good job. Dude, this place sounds awesome. Sign me up. Number seven, Indus Harappan. The Indus Valley Civilization, aka the Harappan peoples, was the first urban civilization from roughly 3300 BCE to 1300 BCE. Located in South Asia, modern day Pakistan, and Northwest India, the Harappans built dozens of sprawling cities with immense planning and architecture. I'm talking water supply systems with recycled drainage, large skyscraper sized buildings. They even developed a number of technologies, including one of the world's first systems of weights and measurements. New techniques in metallurgy producing copper, bronze, lead, and tin. These people were smart. In addition to math and engineering, the Indus Valley Civilization enjoyed arts and crafts. Even games and toys have been found. Baked brick houses, clusters of large iron non-residential buildings, and handcrafted metallurgy. We start to see the foundations here, people. There are even three cities here that are now all UNESCO World Heritage Sites. The latest in 2021, the Kalishchen Desert. Number six, Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were a Semitic group of speaking people who emerged around 3000 BC. 
The term Phoenicia is ancient Greek, meaning a colored dye. It's debated whether Phoenicians were distinct from the broader group of speaking peoples known as the Canaanites. The term Canaanites loosely corresponds to the groups referred to as the Phoenicians, so it's a little messy back then on who's exactly who. The Phoenicians rose in the mid 12th century following the decline and collapse of the late Bronze Age. They were renowned as traders and mariners, becoming the dominant commercial power around. They developed an expansive maritime trade network, helping the exchange of cultures and ideas between Greece, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. They established colonies and trading posts across the Mediterranean as Phoenician society and culture centered around mostly commerce and seafaring. As a kicker, of course, historians and archaeologists revealed this civilization most likely has the world's oldest verified alphabets. I can't even build a boat now, let alone back then with barely an alphabet? Like how? Number 5. Egypt An ancient civilization in northeast Africa situated on the Nile Valley, somewhere around 3100 BCE, splitting Upper and Lower Egypt. First occurring as a series of stable kingdoms, separated by intermediate periods such as the Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms, Egypt was invaded by a number of foreign powers including the Libyans, the Nubians, Assyrians, Persians, Macedonians, and of course, the Greeks. Predictable flooding meant a timed surplus of crops, which supported larger populations year after year. The many achievements of these people include immense quarrying, surveying, and construction using a system of mathematics and science to build and organize what we still visit today. Medicine, irrigation, boat making, the Egyptians did it all. They pushed the boundaries with glass technology, and even invented new forms of literature, and even coined the earliest known drummed up peace treaty. Yeah, don't even get me started on the Sphinx. Have you seen this thing? It's practically being held together with glue and tape at this point. Number 4. Mesopotamia, the land of two rivers. Around 10,000 BCE in what is now modern day Iraq, some of the first fully developed Neolithic cultures began to settle in this fertile crescent known biblically and famously as Mesopotamia. Around 8000 BCE, people in northern Mesopotamia began to cultivate barley and wheat, in which made beer, gruel, soup, and eventually even bread. This is where the earliest signs of civilization began. They were the first to develop trades such as weaving, leatherwork, metalwork, masonry. One of the greatest achievements of ancient Mesopotamia was the invention of the wheel, sometime around 3500 BCE. Mathematics and science was based on a numerical system of 60. This is the source of the 60 minute hour, the 24 hour day, and the 360 degree circle. The Sumerian calendar was three seven day weeks of a lunar month. They were so smart, the astronomers could predict eclipses and solstices. Beer, a calendar, and some wheels? Life was simple back then, huh? Like, just not a care in the world. Number three, the Maya. The Mesoamerican civilization of the Maya was roughly between 1800 BC and 900 AD. Located within the archaeological site and the city of San Juan Teotihuacan municipality in the state of Mexico. This site has been classified a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1987. Teotihuacan was the largest city in the Americas with a population between 125,000 and at its peak, millions, making it at least the sixth largest city in the world during its reign. The Maya script is the most sophisticated, highly developed writing systems in the pre-Columbian Americas. Hieroglyphic writing was being used by the third century. They are known for their art, math, calendars, and astronomical systems. Architecturally, the city consisted of palaces, ceremonial ball courts for sport and sacrifice, and of course, structures precisely aligned for astronomical observation. Number two. Rome. In modern history, ancient Rome refers to the Roman civilization from the founding of the city in the 8th century BC to the collapse of the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. It encompasses the Roman Kingdom, Roman Republic, and Roman Empire. It began as an Italic settlement. The settlement grew into the city of Rome, eventually controlling its neighbors through a combination of treaties and military strength. It eventually dominated and acquired much of Europe, and of that, the surrounding Mediterranean Sea. One of the largest empires in the ancient world. At one point, roughly a quarter of the world's population. Contributed to modern language, religion, society, technology, government, warfare, art. Do as the Romans do, right? Its military created a system of government which was the inspiration for modern republics such as the United States and France. They achieved impressive feats, such as the empire-wide construction of bridges, ports, and roads, as well as the monuments and megalithic buildings splattered all around the world. Every time I flush a toilet, I'm like, man, huh, these guys were good. Number one, 
Turkey. Located in the foothills of the Taurus Mountains, we arrive at Gobekli Tepe. This Neolithic site lays in the southeastern Anatolia region of Turkey and is dated around 9500 BCE. The site consists of a number of large circular structures supported by massive stone pillars. Long story short, it's the first construction site of anything ever. The pillars are richly decorated with abstract, anthropomorphic carvings of people, clothing, and wild animals, thus providing archaeologists insight into this prehistoric peoples and what they were about. Considered the oldest permanent human settlements anywhere in the world, historians link this revolution to the invention and precursor of agriculture. Gobekli Tepe is a monumental complex built on the top of a rocky mountain far from any known sources of water, and having produced no evidence of agricultural has sparked numerous debates over the years. The site's original excavator, Klaus Schmidt, described it as the Earth's first temple ever, a sanctuary used by groups of nomadic hunter-gatherers from all over the world with no permanent inhabitants. Classified a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 2018, radiocarbon dating shows that the earliest exposed structures at Gobekli Tepe were built around 11,500 years ago. It's regarded by some as the archaeological discovery of many lifetimes, since it could profoundly change the understanding of the development of human society and when it exactly started. At number 10, Treaties of the Vessels. I think that most of us love the idea of uncovering some kind of lost treasure. I for one would love to pull an Indiana Jones and uncover artifacts lost to the sands of time, but realistically you need a lot of clues in order to find these things. They could be anywhere. The world is quite a large place, you know. That's why ancient texts and documents are so important to researchers because sometimes they can give clues as to where some treasure might be. This is sort of the case with the Treaties of the Vessels. This ancient Hebrew text claims to reveal the location of where the treasures of King Solomon's temple are hidden. Well, sort of. The text discusses the location of the treasures as well as the fate of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a chest that is said to hold tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. And as you would imagine, these are highly sought after, but no one knows where it is and the Treaties of the Vessels isn't really much help to researchers. The text says that the location of these things will quote, not be revealed until the day of the coming of the Messiah, son of David. So it just teases us with this mystery. We still have to wait to find these treasures. At number 9. Gospel of the Lots of Mary. Have you ever wished that you could know the future? Maybe you want to know how a relationship would play out, or if you should do something about your career, but you just need that little confirmation of future events to help you along. Well, if you lived in ancient times, then you might have sought out the Gospel of the Lots of Mary to help you with your needs. This ancient text is quite the gospel and dates back to around 1500 years. The Gospel of the Lots of Mary doesn't discuss the life of Jesus Christ, but instead contains 37 oracles that were written pretty vaguely. The original text was written in Coptic, an Egyptian language, and has been translated in modern times. The book opens with the words, quote, The Gospel of the Lot of Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, she to whom Gabriel the archangel brought the good news, he who will go forward with his whole heart will obtain what he seeks, only do not be of two minds. End quote. Researchers believe that this book would have been used for divination in an attempt to seek knowledge of the future. Someone in need of answers would seek out this book, ask a question, and then would have gone through a process that would randomly select one of the 37 oracles to give answers to said person's problem. Almost like how we read horoscopes, but much more mysterious. Before we carry on talking about these strange and mysterious texts, why not leave a big ol' thumbs up on this video if you are thoroughly entertained so far? And while you're at it, why not subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one and join the hive. At number 8, Librelintius. This next ancient text almost counts as a hidden message because of where this text was found by researchers. The Liber Lintius is an ancient text written in Estrusian, a language that was used in Italy in ancient times. What makes this text so mysterious is the fact that it was found preserved in the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy that dates back around 2200 years. This ancient text's meaning isn't exactly clear, partially because the Etrusian language isn't fully understood, but researchers believe that the written text on the mummy's wrappings are of a ritual calendar. More 
more research is needed to fully decipher this mysterious text, but it's a really cool find nonetheless. At number seven, Gospel of Judas. Guys, we might have quite the plot twist on our hands, and it's all thanks to this mysterious ancient text. Researchers found a third century text that they called the Gospel of Judas, and after being translated, might have revealed an alternate version of an event from the Bible. Originally written in Coptic, the Gospel of Judas seems to be a depiction of Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Jesus in the New Testament in a positive light. In the New Testament, Judas was said to have betrayed Jesus by revealing his identity to those who had come to arrest him in exchange for 30 pieces of silver, but in the Gospel of Judas, it describes Jesus as asking Judas to betray him in order for him to be crucified so that he could ascend to heaven. This plot twist is debated among some people though, as other researchers have said that the text actually declares Judas as a demon. Either way, it's a new spin on the story that we didn't have before, and I'd say that's pretty darn mysterious. At number six, Grolier Codex. Imagine owning something that you believe was just a piece of art turn out to actually be an ancient artifact. This kind of thing is actually a lot more common than you'd think, since over the years, pillaging and looting of ancient sites have led to many artifacts being misplaced and sold around the world. This is the case with the Grolier Codex. The Grolier Codex is an ancient Mayan codex that contains Maya hieroglyphs, illustrations of gods, and a calendar that tracks the movement of Venus. Want to know where they found it? In a club in New York. The person who acquired the codex, a Mexican collector named Jose Sanez, said that he got it from a group of looters in the 1960s, and after a lot of debate, it was found that the codex that he had was in fact authentic. Researchers found that this ancient text was written on paper that dates back about 800 years and was written using paint known as Maya Blue, which actually wasn't synthesized in a lab until pretty recently. I think it's pretty crazy that this ancient text from the Maya civilization somehow ended up in New York and no one really noticed. At number Number five, Popol Vuh. Just about every civilization has their interpretation of Earth's origins. Some cultures believe that cosmic beings made the Earth, others believed in various gods and various motivations for creating life. One ancient text that was discovered by researchers tells the story of the Maya and their belief of how the world was created. This ancient text known as Popol Vuh, which ultimately is translated to Book of Counsel, is a mythical origin story. According to the tales written in this ancient text, the forefather gods, quote, brought forth the earth from a watery void and endowed it with animals and plants, end quote. The text also describes how the gods had difficulties making humans and tells the story of how they created two heroes twins who went on a series of adventures and even defeated the Lord of the Underworld. The earliest surviving copy of Popol Vuh dates back to 1701, but it is believed that there were earlier copies of the text that might not have been found or have been lost. At number 4, Copper Scroll. Next up, let's talk about another ancient text that discusses the existence of a large treasure. An ancient Hebrew text called the Copper Scroll was found in a cave in the Judean desert. This ancient text is believed to contain recorded details of a vast treasure that may include gold, silver, vessels, and coins. The Copper Scroll dates back to sometime around 70 CE, which coincides with a time when the Roman army laid siege to Jerusalem and the Second Temple, a Jewish holy temple which stood on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, was destroyed. Researchers are still unsure if these treasures described in the Copper Scroll actually exist, as it is still highly debated. Even if these treasures really did exist, it could have already been found back in ancient times, but even still, no treasure as large as the one described in the scroll have been found in Israel or Palestine. At number 3, Dresden Codex. For researchers, being able to find ancient texts is very exciting because it can teach them a lot about a civilization, its people, and their beliefs. However, they're often pretty hard to come by due to a number of reasons like poor preservation, warfare, looting, and more. In the case of the Mayans, many of their artifacts and written documents were believed to have been destroyed by Christian missionaries trying to wipe out any non-Christian beliefs, so when one of their ancient texts is found, it's a pretty big deal. When the Dresden Codex was found, it was a huge accomplishment for researchers. The Dresden Codex Codex is an ancient Mayan document that dates back 800 years and contains 39 sheets of text with beautifully drawn images and text on both sides. Researchers done on this codex indicate that it is a record of the phases of the planet Venus so that the Maya, quote, would be certain that their ceremonial events were being held on the correct day. End quote. The codex first appeared in Germany in 1730, but no one really knows how it got there. At number two, Voynich Manuscript. Now this next ancient text is pretty mysterious simply because no one can read it. 
Dun dun dun. That's right, the Voynich Manuscript, a 250 page book containing illustrations of plants, cosmological symbols, and naked ladies, is carbon dated to have originated sometime in the 15th century. It also contains unreadable text. This book was first discovered in 1912 by an antique book dealer, and since then, the text in the book has yet to have been deciphered. There is speculation amongst researchers that suggests that perhaps the language in this book is a lost language, or code, or perhaps just gibberish. However, a recent study of the book's language suggests that it does have the hallmarks of a real language. You know what I think the Voynich manuscript is? An alien document. Think about it. Aliens came to Earth and they documented what they saw, like native plant species and humans, hence the drawings of women, because come on, how can you not be obsessed with women? Right? And these cosmological symbols found in the book would also be tied to the aliens because, of course, they're from outer space. But what do you guys think? And finally, at number one, Handbook of Ritual Power. Saving the best and most mysterious ancient text for last, we have the Handbook of Ritual Power. This is a 20 page ancient codex that dates back around 1300 years and is ripped in, in Coptic. What's so interesting and mysterious about this little book is its contents. Within the 20 pages of this ancient book are magic spells and formulas, including love spells, spells for curing black jaundice, and even instructions on how to perform an exorcism. It's believed that this ancient text may have been written by a group of Sethians, an ancient Christian sect who praised Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. What adds to the already mysterious contents of the book is the book's opening, as it references a mysterious unknown figure named Bactiotha. A translation of the opening text of the handbook reads, quote, I give thanks to you and I call upon you the Bactiotha, the great one who is very trustworthy, the one who is lord over the forty and the nine kinds of serpents. End quote. The book is now housed in a museum in Sydney after they purchased it from an antiquities dealer in Vienna. How this dealer acquired the book though remains unknown. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Olmec Colossal Heads. The Olmec civilization has often been referred to as the mother culture of Mesoamerica, and from somewhere between 1400 to 400 BC, the civilization rose in the Mexican Gulf Coast. Now, over two millennia later, in 1862, a farmer was digging that very same land that they once lived on, and he came across an extremely large stone head. From here, Research continued, and this turned out to be one of 17 stone heads that are thought to have been portraits of the rulers at the time. The statues are all somewhere from 5 to 10 feet tall, and they are extremely heavy. Like heavier than a full grown elephant. I guess that's how we're measuring weight now. Some use imperial, some use metric. I use elephants. The reason it is believed that these stone heads were made to model rulers of the time is because they all share similar features, but they are each made with different expressions, slightly different facial features, and different headdresses. While the first discovery of the stone head was close to the source of the basalt stone that was used to make them, most of the heads are like 60 miles away from there. So we have absolutely no idea how these ancient people were able to make these stones, we just know it wasn't an easy task by any means. In our number 9 spot today we have the works of old men. The works of old men are structures that were first observed from the air by a British pilot in 1927 and they are located near the Azraq oasis in Jordan. There are hundreds of these wheel like structures that are each over 80 feet wide, some even as large as 200 feet. These huge structures have been dated back so far that they might just be the oldest man made creations that we have ever found. While this is all amazing, we have absolutely no idea what they are or why they were created. The theories range from things like sun tracking to cemeteries to some sort of spiritual relevance, but we really just aren't sure. While things like this are incredible finds, and it's amazing that some of the first man-made things still exist on our earth, it is so crazy how we have no idea what they are or how to use them, and unfortunately, especially because of the fact that it's been thousands and thousands of years, it's most likely that the mysteries surrounding them are totally lost with the past. In our number 8 spot today we have the Siege of Masada. The Siege of Masada took place in 73 AD after the fall of Jerusalem, and it was one of the 
final events of the First Jewish-Roman War. The event took place on and around a large hilltop in what is now current day Israel, but here's where this ancient mega project comes in. The Romans began to build a massive earth ramp on the western side of the fortress of Masada. They managed to build it all while under the constant fire from those defending the area, and it was still just under 2,000 feet long, and it rose up 200 feet in the air. After building this ramp, they then managed to push a siege tower up the ramp. This ramp does mostly still exist, and basically what they ended up doing was like extending the size of the mountain that Masada was built on. It is absolutely insane that they did all of this just to capture people. All of that for like 960 people. Imagine if we had ancient Romans now. Suddenly all of our cities would be actually accessible. Ramps for everyone. In our number 7 spot today we have Stonehenge. Perhaps the most famous of all of the monuments on this list, this prehistoric monument is located in England and it is a set of stones that are oriented towards the sunrise on the summer solstice. This stone monument is thought to have been created somewhere from 3000 to 2000 BC and it truly is one of the most famous landmarks ever. Stonehenge is thought to have been an ancient burial ground right from early in its creation for somewhere around 500 years. There are many theories surrounding this incredible monument regarding who could have created it as experts just aren't quite sure. Since this was from a time before we had written records, we may just never know. Maybe this one is just destined to stay a mystery. In our number 6 spot today we have the Yonaguni Monument. Just off of the coast of Yonaguni, Japan, there is a diving location that was first discovered in 1986 by a diver. He noticed some strange sort of formation that was located on the seabed that looked as if it could be some sort of structure, so he swam down to go and investigate. When he went down and didn't find any more answers to his questions, he of course had to spill the tea on what he had stumbled upon. When researchers heard about this, they ended up diving down to check out what this formation could be, and thus the Yonaguni Monument was officially considered discovered. This monument, which kind of resembles stairs made for giants, is made of sandstone and limestone, but there's one super mysterious thing about it. Experts cannot agree on the origins of this thing. Some people believe it was a naturally occurring formation, while others swear that it was man-made. The Yonaguni Monument is at least 10,000 years old, so at the end of the day, anyone's guess is as good as mine. In our number 5 spot today we have Saxe Huaman. This site is located in Cuzco, Peru, and it is another fascinating and seemingly impossible stone structure that was built by the Incas. This structure was once believed to have been a fortress, but now it is believed that it it may have actually been used for things like ceremonies. Why this is another incredible creation is because of the fact that we can't quite figure out how it could have been built. The stones in the structure fit together so perfectly that they are able to stay together without anything holding them in place, and they've done so for years. This, coupled with how large some of the stones were, is enough to completely stump experts. Despite how well the stones all fit together, apparently they all have different shapes, which has led researchers to believe that the building design was kind of made up as the structure was being built. Imagine that, just improvising building a structure and it lasts for hundreds of years and goes on to stump humanity for a while. I'm just saying, that's pretty cool. It becomes more and more apparent how talented and brilliant the Incas really were. In our number 4 spot today we have the Nazca Lines. If you were to head to the Nazca Desert just about 200 miles southeast of Lima in southern Peru, you'd find the most famous geoglyphs in the world. The Nazca Lines. Researchers believe that these lines might be something like two millennia old, and other than how they are incredible works of art, they are also completely baffling. The geoglyphs are more than 800 long white lines etched into the desert, as well as 300 geometric shapes and 70 different animal figures. The biggest shape stretches about 1,200 feet across, which leads to my point about why these lines are so incredibly fascinating. These images can only be fully seen from high above in the air. So thinking back 2,000 years ago, how did humans make these without the vantage points we have now? I'm not exactly sure, but it definitely is nothing shy of amazing. In our number 3 spot today we have Gobekli Tepe. This is a pre-pottery neolithic archaeological site that is located in Turkey. This site has been dated back all the way to somewhere from 9500 to 8000 BC, making it the world's 
oldest known megaliths, which is just incredible. The site is comprised of a bunch of large circular structures that are being supported by massive stone pillars, many of which are decorated with abstract anthropomorphic details and things which has provided rare and valuable insight into the prehistoric religion and the iconography of the times when this was built. One of the most amazing things about this area is that it was first used at the beginning of the Neolithic period, which marks the oldest human settlements anywhere in the world. It has been called the world's first temple and it was used by groups of nomadic hunter gatherers from a wide area. Without a doubt this was one of the best archaeology finds of our modern society and it gives us just a glimpse into what life was like in prehistoric times. In our number 2 spot today we have the Lothagam North Pillar Site. One of the most incredible archaeological finds in Kenya led to a, well it wasn't exactly a horrifying discovery but it certainly was very unexpected. Around 5,000 years ago a tribe of herders paused by a lake in what is now Kenya in order to bury their dead. This ended up turning into one of the most massive and monumental construction projects Africa had ever seen, which is no easy feat. For 450 years they dug into the bedrock, piled up slabs of sandstone and buried their dead for generations generations with ritual ceremonies and this led to what researchers now consider the earliest and largest monumental cemetery in eastern Africa. Here's the one kind of unexpected thing that they found here at this site though. Along with the bodies of those who had passed, researchers also found 405 gerbil teeth at this site. As it turns out, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for this and it's because they were used to make a headpiece for just one of those who had passed away. This site might not be a as large and tall as some of the other monuments like the pyramids in Giza, but what makes them the most remarkable is that this site was made by the people for the people. Not for emperors or kings and queens, it was for tribe members of every age and gender buried alongside each other. In our number one spot today we have Scara Bray. This is an area that is located in Scotland and it was found in an exceptionally surprising way. In 1850 there was a huge storm that hit Scotland and it was so bad that around 200 people passed away from it. The next day however, once the storm had passed, residents of the Orkney Isles began to notice part of the cliff had dislodged, but it uncovered a sort of hidden settlement. Tests were able to date the site back from 3200 BC to 2200 BC and it was shown to have been inhabited for about 600 years. There were round stone homes here and the roofs were made out of whalebone and peat. The design of this little city suggested that there wasn't a hierarchy but rather a group of people living peacefully as farmers, herdsmen and traders. While the site is small, the houses are in quite great shape for the amount of time it's been. This little settlement is Europe's most complete Neolithic village and while it is older than Stonehenge and the Great Pyramids, it's been called the Scottish Pompeii because of how well preserved it is. No one is exactly sure why the residents of this village abandoned it, but it is likely that a change in climate is somewhat if not fully responsible and a storm might have been the reason those living here had to leave in haste, which is deduced by how all of their belongings were left behind. As we start off with the Khmer Empire. Like a video game, I'm gonna give y'all their stats. So, where it's across today is Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and Thailand. When 800 to 1400, strengths, advanced water system, strong economy, natural resources, weaknesses, uncontrollable population, rival civilizations, overexpansion. Fun fact the Khmer Empire only lost one major naval battle in 600 years. Hella relevant, seeing as the Khmer Empire really embraced that whole water is life thing. The civilization had an extensive water water network so that their capital city, Angkor, would flourish no matter the season. Angkor was also at one point one of our world's largest cities, covering 386 square miles and accommodating around 1 million people. Very hydrated people that is. The advanced water system contained a network of channels and reservoirs that utilized monsoon climates to collect water for use in dry season. Each area of the city had two channels of water running through it for fresh and for soiled, earning it the title of the hydraulic city by our contemporary historian. The gradual decline of the Khmer Empire can be attributed to three main factors. The diluting of their culture through too many new strands of Buddhism, a gradual weakening of their water network, and an overexpansion that brought them into conflict with the neighboring Ayutthaya Kingdom. Alright! 
Okay, one is done, now two for you. Let's check out the Hittites. So, stats, where? Across Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. When? 1700 to 700 BC. Strengths? Expert chariot makers, iron manufacturers, and they had the fortified city of Hatsua. Weaknesses? Drawn out rivalry with the Egyptians, city states had no political unity, and a slow economical advancement. Fun fact, Hittite battle axes were literally shaped like human hands. Yeah, I know, right? Kinda cool. Alrighty, so these guys at their peak actually rivaled Egypt's kingdom and made them look like a bunch of backwood hicks. In fact, they were the ones who were effing up Egypt so bad, Ramses II had to sign a peace treaty with them, only after they had the world's largest chariot battle, because boys will be boys or whatever. So how'd these guys manage to slip from historical radar? Well, it wasn't just being assumed into the Assyrian Empire, it was because, like the Khmer, their culture varied considerably between regions and became too diluted to be consistent. Also, like many other forgotten civilizations, Hittite lands were divided up into city-states with no political unity. The Hittite Empire collapsed in 1160 BC after civil war and a scramble for the throne. Scattered and leaderless, a settlement was formed between the Syro-Hittite people, and this was only for a brief respite before they're invaded by the Assyrians in 700 BC. Love saying this next one's name, it's Pumapunko. Stats, where? Tiwanaku La Paz, Bolivia. When? Somewhere around 500 CE until question mark. Strengths, precision carving and advanced architecture. Weaknesses, being accused of having aliens help. Fun fact, in Amara, Pumapunko means the door of the Puma. Pumapunko was a city already abandoned when the Incas conquered the area in 1470. Predating that, we have no idea who built it and what happened to them. All right, segment done, moving on. No, not really, but could you imagine? Yeah, no, so it was already empty when the Incas came there and they spared no expense incorporating Pumapunko and the rest of Tiwanku City into their empire, believing it to be the place of their deity of creation and where that deity created the ancestral people of all ethnicities and sent them out in the world to populate the respective lands. So, Incas believed the fallen stone portraits near Pumapunko to be the models of those first humans from the creation myth. These stone figures, however, are just depictions from the city's former rulers. The exact origin and age of the site is endlessly disputed. As archaeologists know, Pumapunko was thriving ancient town originating from somewhere around 500 to 600 CE, and it's got mankind's most incredible stonework. Each is cut in such a precise way that they fit together perfectly and lock into each other. Not even a razor blade can slide between them. Naturally, their perfection is all the evidence ancient alien believers need to grab the tinfoil hat. May recognize this next name, it's Etrurias. So, stats time. Where? Central Italy. When? 800 to 250 BCE. Strengths? Construction enterprise, iron and copper trade, urban planning, weaknesses, poor army, territory desirable to invaders, and locality to Rome. Fun fact, the Etruscans invented the idea of armed and contact sport, or as we more commonly know them to be, gladiators. The civilization reached the height of its power in the 6th century BCE when 12 city-states were allied to be the Etruscan League. Being the first real major settlement on the Italian peninsula, Etruria became the basis of the civilization in late antiquity to follow. They were one of the first peoples to dispose of kings and be ruled by the intelligistia of aristocrats and magistrates, and their architecture and construction techniques arguably influenced the Romans as much as the Greeks did, as did the city's overall build and stylization. Even the Latin alphabet and the Roman toga have their origins with the Etruscan people. The growing Roman military juggernaut found Etruscia too good to pass up, and their league of city-states was annexed into the new Roman Republic public in 250 BCE. Alrighty, we are moving on now to the Finica civilization. Stats are, where? Lebanon and Israel. When? 4,000 to 332 BCE. Strengths? Peaceful and diplomatic city-states. Maritime strength. Dye and metal production. Weaknesses? Minimal military strength. No real capital city or stronghold. And the fun fact is, is that the ancient Olympic Games started in Fenica. So, Fenica is known as Canaan in Hebrew and is named after the Phoenicaics, a Greek word for purple, due to their production of the purple dye, which would later become the color of royalty and aristocracy in Greece and Rome, and actually a lot of other places. They were the greatest pioneers of sea travel in the ancient world, 
arguably, and were a peaceful people, never having had a civil war. Equally unknown to many, they are credited with the founding of Carthage, a city that would actually become a major center in both the Carthaginian and Roman empires. This peaceful and diplomatic reputation helped them stave off invasion for a prolonged period, as did their openness to trading and befriending pretty much any nation they came across, as far as Spain and Portugal. Prior to Alexander the Great's conquest, the Persians invaded Funica lands in 539 BCE, but the Macedonian invasion following that was more devastating. After that decline, the Fenicas became a Roman state in 64 CE and developed a Hellenistic society. Shuffling our way forward, we're now doing Assyria. Stats, where? So, Iran and Syria, when 2400 BCE to 1300 CE, their strengths are technological advances, iron weapons, and emphasis on education, and their weaknesses, proximity to other strong kingdoms, and their administration spread a little too thinly. Fun factoid, Assyria contained several zoos as one of their kings was obsessed with animals. And not only were they the pioneers of animal domestication, but Assyrian unique policy for defeated powers was to not incorporate their people into the nation, but deport them and ensure there's no rebellion under their rule, which is literally the smartest thing I've heard from an ancient civilization. Instead of just taking the whole bunch of people, just leave them there. Exceptions were only made if the individual or group was believed to be of greater use to the Assyrians, such as scholars. Because one of the Assyrians' greatest achievements was in education, as the school of Nisbis is believed to be the first ever university. The Assyrians were also attributed with building some of the first aqueducts and arches hundreds of years before the Romans and introducing the modern idea of keeping time. The final Assyrian demise is shrouded in mystery, but it's believed they entered a dark age in 1300 after constant wars with the Byzantine Empire. After their empire crumbled, their civilization saw a mass influx of Jewish and Arabian people, and in came high taxes on the Christian Assyrians, who mostly folded under the pressure to convert to Islam. As the Assyrians were ethnically distinct from both Arabs and Jews, this effectively ended the idea of being Assyrian. I mentioned this civilization in a recent video and a little bit before, let's regroup with the Tiwanaku. This civilization proved you didn't need an army to survive. Stat time, where? Bolivia, when? 500 to 900. Strengths, good agricultural location, construction techniques, expert farmers, weaknesses, no writing system, overuse of their farming land, no military presence. And fun fact, Taiwanaku cities were so grand that when the Incas discover them, they believe they were made by the gods. So Taiwanaku had colonized both Chile and Peru. They were a multi-ethnic society who had settled in the upper reaches of the Andes and now are remembered for the remarkable monuments that still stand today, as well as their underground drainage for fresh and soiled water, paved streets, and cities that were planned in a grid system. Tiwanaku became expert farmers and pioneered a method of farming known as flood raised field agriculture which used an effective system of irrigation. This well fed population of over 10,000 allowed the Tiwanaku to expand into many other areas of South America. The civilization was at its peak of its powers in the 8th century but mysteriously ended in the 9th. No one's quite sure why the Tiwanaku disappeared. But it's believed that they as well as other similar culture known as the Wari were victims of a dramatic shift in climate which devastated crops and caused a mass starvation. As they had no writing system, the Taiwanaku are truly a forgotten civilization. Always a fun word to say, Minoan life is next. Stats, where? Crate, when? 3000 to 1100 BCE. Strengths, bureaucratic hierarchy, shipbuilding, knowledge of metallurgy. Weaknesses, weak military and natural disasters. Your fun Minoan fact is that the Minoans had a sport that involved jumping over bull's horns. Of all the lost civilizations, the Minoans may be the most mysterious, arguably the first European civilization, they first settled in Crete in about 3000 BCE and remained isolated there for literal centuries before establishing trades. Minoan culture originally had no centralized government and a flexible ruling system with large grand palaces acting as a key area of administration. Their tombs, known as tholos, were a key architectural feature along with their paved road system, running water and pottery that were later incorporated by Greek and Roman civilizations. By 2000 BCE, kings had assumed control of the island, signaling the beginning of a bureaucratic system and social hierarchy, and women also played a large role in that society, serving as administrators and priestresses, and they had the same rights as men. It's that kind of unity that made Minoans very remarkable. But womp womp, around 1700 BCE, an earthquake rips Crete a new one and destroys most of the island's settlements. They managed to recover from this natural disaster, but now had the Greeks and the Mycenaeans threatening trade interests. Their luck got even worse when in 1375, the island's largest city, Knossos, was devastated 
devastated and crippled the Minoan people who were dispatched by an oncoming invasion in 1100 BCE. Oh yeah ladies, homies and gents, it's Indus Valley time. What are their stats? So where? India, Afghanistan, Pakistan. When? 3300 BCE to 1300 BCE. And in its mature form 2600 BCE to 1900 BCE. Strengths, extremely advanced, mathematics and metallurgy. Weaknesses, natural disaster, overpopulation, failed trade. Fun fact, unlike other ancient civilizations, archaeologists have never found any evidence of palaces or temples in the Indus Valley, which suggests that there were no priests or kings. The Indus River Valley Civilization of 3300 to 13 BC was also known as the Harappan Civilization. They were important innovators, but little is understood about the Indus script and as a result, little is known about the Indus River Valley Civilization's institutions and system of governance. What is 100% known is this was likely the most advanced ancient society there had ever been. So what could have made it end? Historians believe things start to fall apart in 1900 BC and by 1700 many of the Indus Valley cities had been abandoned. Trade was very important to their civilization. Their main trade partner was Mesopotamia. And around the time the Indus cities started to fail, Mesopotamia was going through huge political problems and their trade networks collapsed. This would have had a big impact on work, thus money. So some historians think this is what collapsed the Indus cities. Alternatively, Indus civilization collapsed because of changes to the geography and climate of the area. Movements in the Indus River may have changed the direction or caused flood. The main cities were closely linked to the river so changes would have had a terrible effect and driven everyone out. And last, but never the least, we've got Vinca. Last stats round. So our where is Serbia and Kosovo primarily, but also Bosnia, Romania, Bulgaria, Montenegro, Macedonia, and Greece. When? From 5700 to 4500 BC. Strengths, cultural uniformity and metallurgy and also being insanely advanced. Weaknesses, not trading enough statues. Last fun fact of the video, they were so modern, their houses, clothing, and jewelry are all stylistically incredibly similar to ours now. Vinca culture and its people begin in the mid 6th millennia BC when the second wave of migration came to the Balkans from the shores of Asia Minor to create the largest Neolithic settlement in all of Europe. Research and analysis of artifacts and the settlements reveal that a culture and a community of people that had actually had a very advanced way of life for the time. Until this day no weapons have ever been found during excavations and it makes us draw the conclusion that they were not warriors but peaceful and gentle. Remains of houses show traces of insulation against elements and inside houses were intricate multi room layouts and water systems. Finding decorative ceramic cups and sophisticated tools all speak to a relatively comfortable lifestyle, as does the mini dresses and the shorts and the fitted pants and skirts and the dainty jewelry. Possibly the most interesting find is the presence of copper objects and metallurgy, which date from well before the metal ages began. However, it's the same copper that caused the disappearance of the Vikna culture. While people out here made fortunes on the jewelry and the tools of copper, others used it to make weapons and seize their treasure. As the the people in Vikna were painfully peaceful, the downfall then began. Number 10, cold as the wind blows. Japan, we love the people, the food, the culture, and the samurai, because let's be honest, armored gentlemen of high morals with really sharp swords is just cool. Kublai Khan, being not as cool as Japan, said to himself and his massive ever growing army, we should go get some cool from Japan. And go to get cool they did. While some initial boat crossings and evasions went okay, two very notable instances where it did not go very well for the Mongol invaders. The worst incident being on August 12, 1281, with a combined fleet of 4,400 ships, over 140,000 Mongol warriors were ready to invade, when seemingly a large typhoon came out of nowhere and devastated the Mongol forces, with at least half of the men drowning and only a few hundred ships remained. Casualties were very high. Those that made it to shore were hunted down by the 40,000 samurai awaiting battle. Shortly after the typhoon was dubbed the Divine Wind and was thought to be a gift from the gods. Holy for Japan, unholy for the Khan. Number 9. Ninja Vanish Samurai are distinguished by their colorful leather armor and katanas that are forged with great care and a code of honor that was upheld at all costs. But they were not the only warriors of ye olde times in Japan. The ninja needs no introduction, but here it goes anyway. Stealthy warriors cloaked in black who were hired for tactical espionage and a really weird movie with turtles eating pizza with a rat. They were mercenaries hired by Daimos and even samurai to get the misdeeds of war done. Sabotage and assassination were necessary in the rebellious and political climate Japan found itself in. 
it would see many political shifts and leaders fighting for control of a unified and fractured Japan. Number 8. My Eyes! As previously mentioned, the ninja were stealthy warriors who did the dirty jobs no one else could. Specifically samurai, as the Bushido code literally forbade them from it. And honestly, they were kind of high sniffing their own farts, as they felt a lot of things were below them. Including ninjas. I for one would not want to disrespect such a worthy foe. What the ninja lack in a full military force or simply being in a traditional battle, they make up for it with their tactics and weapons. Equipped with a variety of weapons with a variety of uses, the most unholiest weapon in the ninja's arsenal was the Mitsubishi egg, not to be confused with Mitsubishi. A small container of sorts that held dirt and dust that when used would blind and disorientate the enemy. The worst flavor of this egg being filled with crushed glass. Yeah, crushed glass in the eye. It caused excruciating pain and would be quite difficult to deal with medically at the time. Honestly, who throws glass in eyes? Number 7. You can't come in. Tokugawa Lamitsu was the big bad shogun in power. And when you're the big bad shogun in power, you get to make big bad decisions. He ushered in the beginning of the Edo period, one that would see Japan prosper for a while, but it did eventually decline. Perhaps the worst part of this time was Japan's isolation. Japan basically locked itself in its bedroom and with a roar of prepubescent rage, told the world not to come into my room. Tokugawa forbade any Japanese ships from leaving and anyone from entering. The penalty for disobeying such rule was death. Japan was nervous at the time as many European nations were beginning to colonize. And if they could rip apart a dynasty like China, surely they would be next. This isolation period lasted over 200 years. And while the world moved on, Japan kind of stayed frozen in time. Of course, like most laws, they get broken. And on the southern tips of Japan's coast, there was some important trading with the Dutch, but we won't tell anybody. Number 6. Manifest Destiny Looking back on history, the United States and Japan are probably most recognized together as being combatants of that one war with that weird mustache guy, whatever it was called. And that war ending in the worst party favor ever, honestly. But that wasn't the first time these two nations met. It was a beautiful summer day in 1853 when just off the shores of Tokyo Bay, some strange ships came into view. They were American ships with cannons. And they came bearing gifts to the emperor. And a very real ultimatum that can be summed up as, my friends, you have been closed for too long. Open for trade or else be annihilated, then open for trade. After some time, the Japanese really didn't have a choice. They dissolved the 200 year order to be isolated. The Americans were looking for trade, but in truth, a large motivation for their forced opening of Japan was manifest destiny. God, God bless America, God bless them. Number 5. When in Rome Having a large quantity of warships in your harbor with shiny new weapons and technology is bad for one's health. But worse than that, it puts you in a position to be colonized. And to be fair, there was a good chance of that happening. From multiple nations actually. So when given an ultimatum, it was time to make a decision. But perhaps this wasn't all bad. The Japanese actually came up with a rather good solution. What if we take all the new technology and run with it? Maybe it's time to colonize some places ourselves, thought a room full of people ready to overthrow the feudal government with modern technology. And that's exactly what they did. An event in Japanese history called the Meiji Restoration was just that. What's unholy about the whole thing is how fast they did it. Restoring the imperial reign but at the same time making it a very modern one. Within a few years it had become the most powerful superpower in Asia. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Number 4. The Last Samurai Japan went from feudal kingdoms to an imperial powerhouse maybe too quickly. Samurai for the longest time were a part of Japanese nobility. Swords were hired that became so rich and powerful that they essentially became the government themselves. So when the Meiji Restoration came about, the use of knights for hire really wasn't necessary with an imperial army and government. Tensions rose as a samurai rebellion had broken out. The samurai of the old world with traditional weapons, some firearms, and the new and powerful imperial Japanese army with modern weapons and lots of soldiers. After imperial Japanese victory, Japan would shortly begin its expansion and colonization of Asia, taking the stage as a major world player. Number 3. Stomach Pains 
If you know anything about Japanese history, you knew this was coming. No, not the Logan Paul incident, but seppuku, the tradition of unaliving yourself with the most pain possible. Look, you got to give samurai credit. They follow that Bushido code to the T. I mean, I can't even commit to a good book sometimes. But as crazy as the tradition sounds to us, to the samurai, honor means everything. Often done when defeated or disgraced, it's a ritual knife to the belly. And see you soon in the afterlife, almighty oh emperor. The most well known case of this was the tale of the 47 Ronin, who, after being disgraced and avenging their master, were granted seppuku by the shogun. The story has been told in many plays and even some films. Number two, tis but a scratch, sir. Katanas are beautiful pieces of art in warfare. Just ask anyone at an anime convention, they'll tell you. But in all seriousness, a lot of time and effort goes into constructing a samurai blade. One might even say the blacksmith's soul gets put into every strike of his hammer. So when the blade is completed, you gotta test drive it. Make sure it's sharp. To test the sharpness of a samurai edge, you would use bamboo, animals, and the occasional criminal. This practice was called Tameshigiri. That's right. They would test it on people. But I mean, what better way to know what your sword is going to do than by knowing what it's going to do? Katanas could easily remove limbs from torsos. Records of these events have provided some knowledge of the human body's resistance to edge weapons. Thanks, Samurai. And number one, artsy brothels. Geisha women wore beautiful kimono robes and were oftentimes mistaken for being courtesans. While in some cases that is true about geishas, they were more like me. Wait, what? All jokes aside, they were more humble hosts for these pleasure quarters, <laughs> oftentimes entertaining men before the scandalous behavior occurred. This was a time of great cultural and artistic expansion in Japan. So these pleasure houses were legal. A lot of these women, while not having the same amount of freedom and choice as today, actually did have more than their European counterparts. Nice. Number 10. The Sins of Our Fathers Law and Order is not just a hit drama from the 90s with a killer soundtrack but something that started with the civilizations a very long time ago. King Hammurabi and his code of law comes to mind. But today, we're talking about ancient Persia. We're talking about a corrupt judge named Sisimans. After taking a bribe and delivering a not so unbiased verdict, the king found out and was most displeased. This is one of the worst things to do to another human being, but poor Sisimans was flayed. Or in simpler terms, they done skin that feather alive. To make an unholy situation even more uncomfortable, they made a chair and used his hide as a material and made his son sit in the flesh chair to make his own judgments. Can't help but think that you'd be sitting there all day thinking of dear old dad because you're sitting on top of a chair that's kind of fuzzy because dad had a lot of back hair. Yikes. Number nine, the annual purge. I don't know about you folks at home, but I love the holiday season. For me specifically, Christmas. And to me, the meaning of Christmas is something less to do with religious background, but just good cheer. Spending time with loved ones and friends and really enjoying a nice homemade meal. I mean, come on, turkey with a stuffing. <laughs> can't go wrong there. And honestly, you can't beat a good stuffing. I love it. But looking back at ancient Persia, there was a different kind of holiday. One that also has its roots in uh, less about religion and more about cold blooded killings. There were Zoroastrian priests called the Magi, and although they weren't Persian, they were somewhat respected in Persian culture. But when a plot to overthrow the king was enacted, the Persians were not too happy and slaughtered the people responsible for the coup. But just for good measure, they also slaughtered all the other priests in the palace. Okay, but they might have missed some outside in the city and they had to get them too. You know what, how about every year on this day we go on a magi hunt? So it became a holiday. Every year on the day of the coup, there was a grand feast and then a hunt for the remaining survivors. That's really comforting, that's nice. Number eight, poaching. It's 2021, we all know it's super uncool to poach. Illegally hunting endangered species for fun or just one sought after piece of the animal like elephant tusks for ivory. Our Persian friends of the past just might have been partaking in the poaching of rhinos. While in the ancient world the laws of today were not around to protect animals, the reason was still there and people wanted horns. For some reason, however, people thought that rhino horn held the power to purify water. Thus, it was used to detect poisonous liquids. It's a superstitious belief that actually would be carried on for a very long time. Rhino horn did have other uses in civilizations, but I like to think it was a coolness factor. You can't tell me drinking wine out of a hollowed out horn isn't cool, come on. Number seven, Marvin's room. Hey man, it's okay. We've all been there. We all felt that kind of hurt before. You're drunk, it's 3 a.m. in a big city with lights. She hurt you bad, dude. But you should just call her. Just see if she picks up. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe you should get really drunk and then come up with a solution and then see if it still sounds like a solid plan in the morning when you're sober. Yeah, 
When ancient Persians had a big decision to make, they used dad wisdom. Get super drunk and then think about critical events in life that require tough decision making. And when you're sober in the morning, do it drunk you thought. Being honest was a big part of Persian culture. And when are people at their most honest? So the theory kind of makes sense to me. I just know that when I wake up in the morning after nurturing a case of beer, that last night's thoughts don't always translate well in the morning. Number six, the land of milk and honey. Another creative punishment for the people who want to lose sleep tonight, a punishment for crimes Persians had come up with was scapism. This is where the Persians would feed a convicted criminal milk and honey. Sounds awesome, right? Well, not exactly. See, they entrap the person between two boats. And every day, they would force feed someone milk and honey. Milk and honey, milk and honey. Over and over and over again. Also, slathering the mixture of the two on the poor helpless criminal. As time went on, flies and bugs would find themselves interested in a sweet smelling crook. As one must also use the bathroom after all that beautiful rich consumption. A true horror to see, but after enough time, the person who was unlucky enough to be in such a position slowly and painfully died in a bog of their own filth and rodent infested area. Most likely dying of septic shock. I don't even have a joke for this one. This is something that should just be in the next Saw movie. Ugh. Number five, ashes to ashes. Here's another fun punishment. Man, these guys are really creative. This one is mentioned in the Bible, so you know it's going to be good. Basically, the Persians built a tower, and it was filled with ash. Drop criminals into the ash tower, or there were two large paddles connected to the turning wheels outside that would churn the ash and victim inside, suffocating on the hot ash. Making for a hot and dusty storm of hell and unholy foulness I can't even begin to describe. Like most things in history from this time, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. It could be very true, or not so true. As the Persian Empire did not leave us with much, and most knowledge of them comes from Greeks and Greek historians. But like most stories, there's truth in everything. And if that's even close to the truth, well, that's just not right, man. Number four, this is Sparta. Despite what a 2006 movie with spray on abs might mislead you, the Battle of Thermopylae was no laughing matter. It pitted the very brave Spartans against the Persian invaders. And there were a lot of them. Like, really a lot of them. Attack after attack after attack, the Persians were not getting anywhere. It wasn't until one of the Greeks betrayed the Spartans by leaving the Persians on a flank that would result in the destruction of the Spartans. Although the Persians were victorious, it wasn't since a Pyrrhic victory, as the loss of life on the Persian side far outnumbered the deaths of the Spartans. It's a battle that would be remembered for its bravery, and enough to have a movie made about it many, many years later. Number three. Here comes the boy. So after a failed attack on Greece, Persia was kind of down about that. No money in the treasury meant that the once great Persian empire was on the decline. So what better time to invade? And that's just what Alexander the Great did. Through a very lengthy campaign that lasted 10 years and a very formidable fighting force, most likely the strongest ever at the time, he shattered the declining Persian empire. He even managed to capture the city of Babylon. Talk about kicking a guy while he's down. His rule of the Persian Empire unfortunately was short lived, as he died not too long after that at the ripe old age of 32. Boy, I sure hope I lived to the ripe age of 32. Number two, the protection of Meow. Before the Persian Empire was no more, they were actually a very powerful empire. So powerful that they wanted a piece of Egypt. This war may have also been started by an insult from the pharaoh, but expanding was probably more likely. What makes this war so notable is the absolute five head play by Persia. Persia knew of the Egyptian culture and knew about their idolization of cats. So, to aid them in the invasion, the king advised them to use kitty power. Soldiers were painting cats in the god Bastet in order for Egyptians to not dare destroy an image of their god. More ridiculous than that was the use of live cats. Stray cats were rounded up and kept during battle in order to prevent the very lethal arrow fire. Soldiers still died in battle, but it is said that the cats gave enough of an advantage for there to be a Persian victory. Decent. Number one, progressive for the time. Looking back in time, we can all acknowledge that maybe we weren't so nice. And as time has moved on, we've gotten more progressive. When you think of ancient empires, you don't really think of progressive, but surprisingly, Persia was for the time. Specifically, women's rights. Women were free to move about. They were allowed to work and be higher ups and manage. But probably the most important aspect was the right to own business and property, which their European counterparts simply could not do. Look at you, Asian Persia. Way to go. Look at you. I never 10 creation. 
Every religion and civilization from the dawn of humanity has come up with their own unique stories as to how the world was created. Some civilizations have credited aliens, others have credited a benevolent god, and many of these gods have their own unique ways of creating life. Though we've heard stories of gods creating people out of things like corn or mud or just thin air, I don't think these stories could even compare to the ancient Egyptian story of creation. These ancient people believed that their very first god, Atum, created himself. As such, he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with, and so to create his and thus create humanity, he, well, he busted it. Literally. He just gave himself a one to meat massage and boom. Out of that process, he created his kids, Shu and Tefnut. A very fitting name, if you ask me. This legend, I guess you could say, created the term the god's hand. And this was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. This term was also carried over into other civilizations, like in the Greco Roman period. So if you ever hear someone say god's hand, now you know where that came from. At number nine, cheating death. These days, if you get caught cheating on your partner, the worst that could happen to you is you break up, or you get a divorce, or maybe even get exposed on social media. But back in the times of ancient Egypt, the punishment for adultery was much, much worse than having your relationship end. Instead, your life would be the thing that ends. Obviously, in any civilization, any kind of relationship can always happen outside of a marriage. The only varying difference is the punishment for it. For the ancient Egyptians, being caught having an adulterous relationship was punishable by death. Pretty harsh for having a sneaky link, but I guess they took their relationships much more seriously back then. One of the most famous cases of a serial adulterer, if you will, came from a man named Peneb, who was known to sleep with many married women and even had his own son join in on his escapades too. As you can imagine, things didn't really end well for them, so if you ever go back in time to ancient Egypt, just be careful of who you sleep with. Before we continue talking about some of the things that your teachers might not have taught you about ancient Egypt, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Ancient WAP. Last year, there was a huge scandal concerning Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion's song WAP. It's a pretty racy song that had a lot of people up in arms about it, and it was all over the news. I mean, if you ever heard any songs from the early 2000s, then you would know that this kind of musical content really isn't a new thing, and school songs have been a part of society for a really long time, but it might surprise you to know that they even had some risque songs even back in the times of ancient Egypt. Historians have discovered some of these songs, one of which I can recite to you, and it uses some pretty imaginative wording to describe a woman's body. In an excerpt from said song, it says, quote, the one, the sister without peer, the handsomest of all. She looks like the rising morning star. At the start of a happy year, shining bright, fair of skin, lovely the look of her eyes, sweet the speech of her lips, she has not a word too much. Upright neck, shining breast, her hair true lapis lazuli, arms surpassing gold, fingers like lotus buds, heavy thighs and narrow waist, her legs parade her beauty. With graceful steps she treads the ground, captures my heart with her movement." End quote. Now, it's no WAP, but for the ancient Egyptians, it was pretty spicy. At number seven, the ancient hub. Back in ancient times, people needed some spicy content to make themselves happy, you know? Before we had only fans and the hub, people in ancient Egypt had their own adult content to enjoy during their alone time. This piece of content was called the Turin Papyrus, and it was essentially just a scroll of a bunch of images on it with people getting busy in some frankly unimaginable positions. Like, I don't know when the Kama Sutra was created, but I feel like the Turin Papyrus certainly gave it a run for its money. The purpose of this papyrus is pretty much unknown, but there are some theories to explain its origin and why it was created, some thinking that it had political ties or something. Either way, historians use this document to further understand times in ancient Egypt. At number 6, Magic Attraction. You know, we can't always have the best game when it comes to finding a partner. Sometimes it can be hard to get someone to go out with you. Many people just don't give up until they succeed, and sometimes that means that they will go to many lengths just to get a date with their crush. This was seen a lot in ancient Egypt, and at one point in later years of their civilization, they practiced magic to attract the one that they loved. 
Turns out that they practiced voodoo to get someone interested in them and it was commonly done by men seeking out the woman of their dreams. In one case of this voodoo for love practice, a man had a magician make a voodoo doll of a woman that he wanted all to himself. The magician pierced the figurine with bronze nails and inscribed a tablet on it with a spell saying that this woman would not be able to drink, eat, or be with another man besides the one seeking her out. The spell also supposedly summoned a demon to follow her and pull her hair and intestines until she found her way to him. Sounds a little intense, but hey, I guess that's just what you do when you don't have Tinder. At number 5, Sneaky Link. In ancient Egyptian literature, women were often portrayed as seductresses. One of the more famous stories telling the tale of a seductress is one called the Tale of the Two Brothers. Essentially, the story goes that a man, his wife, and his younger brother all lived together. One day, the two men went out to do some farm work, and while they were out, the one man told his brother to go back to the house to get some grain sacks. When he reached the house, the wife noticed the brother and complimented him on his strength and tried to seduce him. The brother got angry and refused, but told the wife that he wouldn't say anything to her husband about their encounter. Still, she was worried that the brother would snitch, and so she made herself look like she had been beaten up, and when her husband returned, she pretended like the brother was the one who tried to seduce her. The husband got angry and threatened to kill his brother, but in an attempt to save his own skin, the brother told the husband the truth and even cut his bits off and threw his pee pee into the river just to prove his point, where it was promptly eaten by fish. Unfortunate. The husband then returned home to his wife, where he killed her and fed her to dogs. Not a happy ending for anyone, but it gives you a real sense of how adultery worked back in those days. At number 4, no Viagra. Just like anyone else these days, back in ancient Egypt, sometimes people had performance issues. Impotence was apparently a really big issue for many Egyptian men. It was such a common issue that sometimes it infiltrated their art and there were some scrolls and statues about it. An ancient Egyptian proverb was created about such a topic that said, quote, He who is shy to have intercourse with his wife will not get any children. Now obviously there are things nowadays that can help with such an issue, but back then people resulted to prayer and magic to help their little buddies out. Don't really know how well that worked out for them, but it's a struggle that a lot of people face, so at least they weren't alone. At number 3, LGBTQ+. As with anywhere on earth, there were same sex relationships, and the same goes for ancient Egypt, however documentation of such things were far and few. The only 100% clear cut case of same sex relationships that was documented in ancient Egypt comes from the story of Horus and Seth. The story goes that Horus and Seth were both vying for the throne, and one night Horus pretended to be drunk while Seth tried to take advantage of him while Horus slept. Not the greatest example, but it's what we've got that's actually confirmed. Another potential recorded gay relationship may have come from Egypt's King Pepu II, who was thought to have had a secret relationship with one of his generals at nighttime. One of the most well known potential gay relationships from those times, though, comes from a piece of Egyptian art that showed two men touching noses. Doesn't seem like anything too intimate, but back then, touching noses was another way of kissing. The two men depicted, though, were thought to be brothers, so it's theorized that there was something a little spicy going on there, but we don't have to think about that one too hard. At number two, dirty insults. What is your favorite insult? Don't be shy, you can tell me, this is a safe space. I guess I have a number of favorites, but one that I quite enjoy is saying that someone's mother is a horker, like in Skyrim. Back in the times of ancient Egypt, however, insults often included some kind of note. If they needed to hurl an insult at someone, they might say something like, quote, may you copulate with a donkey, or may a donkey copulate with your wife. People would also combine some kind of note with pointing out someone's flaws to create an insult. In a note found from one of the people who built one of the great pyramids, they insulted one of their co-builders by saying, quote, you are not a man because you cannot get your wives pregnant like your fellow men. Like damn, that's pretty cold dude. And finally at number one, the magic pee pee. <laughs> Now, I had to save this next fact for our number one spot because it's probably one of the most bizarre things that I've ever learned about ancient Egypt. The Egyptian god Min was the male fertility god, and let's just say that he was quite unique. He was known for his bold feathered headdress and the fact that his loincloth snake was always being charmed, if you get what I'm saying. Men suffering from impotence would make offerings to him to help them with their fertility problems. Even to this day, figures of the god Min are used in magic rites. Men and women still visit the ancient temples to find figures of the god and literally rub his 
to overcome their problems. Sounds strange, but apparently so many people have done it that the stone that it's carved into has become worn down or darkened from how many hands have touched it. Now I can only imagine what this god's body count was. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Empress of Austria. The saying wrong place at the wrong time couldn't be used more in this case. Empress Elizabeth of Austria, she was sadly taken out by somebody who just wanted to attack a royal. He didn't have anything against Elizabeth per se, this man was an Italian anarchist named Luigi Luceni, and that fateful day, September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated that he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level at all. So what had happened was he intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans, but when Luigi arrived a little too late in Geneva, the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper, saw Elizabeth, and found out where she was staying, and he waited for her to leave that hotel. That's how easy it was. People are so creepy. Keep an eye open. If you're a queen, keep your eyes open. This is scary. Number nine. Royal Curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. I mean, a storm had flooded a cathedral and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area, but on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. These remains, with the crowns still attached, might I add, were from the 15th century. What a find, right? Well, sadly, the remains were all over this flooded tomb now. It wasn't really in one spot. It was horrible. And now after these discoveries, that's when things got really mysterious. Those involved in the findings began to die off in unusual circumstances, one after another. And it happened pretty quick, too. One professor had died after falling down a shaft in his apartment. He had a heart attack. An engineer had died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues. Okay. Another professor years later who worked in the crypt as well became paralyzed at age 62. A sculptor involved died when untying his shoelace. Just the weirdest way to go out. That's the only details that we know. Just, I don't know, use your imagination, I guess. Maybe he fell and hit his head. That's sad, it's tragic. And another professor died in 1936, shortly after visiting the crypt as well. I sure hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were trying to preserve their history and avoid the crypt from flooding. Like, I don't know, we need a Ouija board to clear this whole thing up. We were trying to help you with the sandbags. Number eight, Queen Caroline. In a list of unusual ways that people have died, odds are it's going to get a little gruesome, a little messy. After all, that's why you click this video, right? Right? Some ancient queens die natural causes and then history remembers them for their reign. In this case, history remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she died. It was written in an epigram from the 18th century from a poet named Alexander Pope. It, he wrote down, here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. It rhymes? Like, come on, man, you didn't have to do this. This is horrible. That's like a prank almost. I can't believe somebody was like, yeah, 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 write that down. That's good, that's good. Did it rhyme? Yeah, she'd like that for sure. R.I.P. Number seven, Anne Boleyn. The second wife of King Henry VIII. Yes, we have a few on this list. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Boleyn. Yeah, the uh, ancient days were a little bit odd. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close friend, I mean he was the groom of the stool, so they were tight. He literally would wipe his So on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish, basically. Anne wasn't even present when these events went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, so there's no way in hell she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her little neck before being taken out with a sword as well. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial. Somebody had to go and get an old elm chest from the tower armory. They used a chest to bury her body near her brother, Lord Rochford. A chest, horrible, that's so horrible. Number six, Mary Queen of Scots. If you're a murderino, this one's pretty juicy, listen up. Back in 1565, Mary was determined to take the throne for herself. When Mary was just six days old, her father, King James V, had passed away, so she ascended to the throne. She was about to marry the King of France in 1558, but he passed away, so she returned to Scotland as the country's monarch. Her next plan was to marry her cousin, Lord Darnley, so now, if something were to happen to Elizabeth, Mary would be yet again lined up for the throne. That cousin ended up dying in a random explosion, and then years later, in 1568, Queen Elizabeth had welcomed Mary after she fled to England. So Mary was close, but now what? Well, Elizabeth had found out that Mary was involved in English, Catholic, and Spanish plots to overthrow her, so she was then placed on house arrest. 
fair, more than fair, more than fair. Cut to 19 years later, 1586, a letter had emerged revealing that Mary was involved in a plot to have her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, killed. She was then sentenced to death and her head was taken off for treason. History is dark, my friends. Even if your family, it's, shit gets crazy. Number five, Charlotte Augusta. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales lost her life in 1817. And when I say ancient, this is probably the most recent that I'll go, because I know ancient means way back, I gotcha. But I have to include this one because as far as royals go, she was loved at this time. She ended up falling in love with Britain's Prince Leopold, but a year and a half later, she died giving birth. She was healthy at the time. She was only 21 years old when this happened. Charlotte was lined up to be the queen one day and historical accounts say that the doctors here were at fault. Charlotte's tragic passing had vendors running out of black fabric. That's how rock the public was right after this. Just massive displays of grief. What do you guys think? Comment down below. Was this a doctor conspiracy or just classic medieval times? It's the olden days. We can't really do as much. Let us know. Number four, Catherine Howard. Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. Such a short amount of time, but why? Being the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn, he just gave her all the gifts and she was just 19 years old. Sounds great so far, but you know, because of his list, things won't end up well. Their marriage didn't even last a year until rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, rumors started spreading about infidelity. There was a small amount of evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, so a jealous mad king got jealous and mad again. Shocker. You had me at fifth wife, I don't know. She was executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green on February 13th, 1542. Number three, Catherine Parr. When Catherine Parr got a position in Princess Mary's house in 1542, she met King Henry VIII. She was smart, she was 30 years old, so it was a step in the right direction age-wise when it comes to these queens and King Henry. Not that there's anything wrong with marrying somebody younger, that's not what I'm saying, but it's just, well, look at this list. All these people died, spoiler alert. So the older, the better at least. I don't know. She was seen as somebody who could nurse the king in his dying age, so the public liked her. She was the first English queen also to write and publish her own books. Now, come 1543, Catherine gave up her man, Thomas Seymour, to marry the king. The two got married that July at Hampton Court Palace, and from that point on, her beliefs were deemed dangerous. Queen Catherine was a supporter of the English Reformation, and Catherine's religious opponents were plotting against her, and they tried to convince the king that she was dangerous. Her arrest was even planned, everything was kind of going in a bad direction. And then Catherine went to King Henry right away and then asked for forgiveness herself. You know, for pushing her views too far many times before, and he forgave her. Meanwhile, others are losing heads for having relationships. Okay. Her and Henry were married for five years, and then after his death, she married Thomas Seymour just a few months later. And then come September 1548, she died after giving birth to her daughter. The account of her death comes from a lady-in-waiting and friend of Catherine Parr, comes from Elizabeth Tyrett, only her account is fishy because she never liked Thomas Seymour to begin with. She made it seem like Catherine was speaking about her husband in a negative manner when she was dying, and this is the only time in history where that's ever been an idea. So what do you think? It's like broken telephone, but hundreds of years ago. I'm like, I, maybe she was friends? I don't know. Sounds like a conspiracy. Number two, Anne of Cleves. Where to even begin here? Okay, this one is sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like the birth of Tinder right now. I'm not joking, this actually happened. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. She was compared to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. I praiseth thou beauty, madam. Super swipe. A treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like she did in her portrait. Yep, real life, this is what really happened. He tried to stop the wedding because of this, but it was too late. They had to follow through and they got married on January 6th, 1540. And later accepted the divorce because obviously a divorce was in play after what you just heard. And then she lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Of all the ways to be remembered in history, King Henry made this horrible for Anne. And finally, number one, Cleopatra. Last of the Egyptian pharaohs and last on our list. One of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra died. 
What happened? It's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit, but many believe that Cleopatra also allowed a poisonous snake to end her life. They think it was a bite from an asp. But there's also a large amount of historians that also believe that she poisoned herself using a hairpin. Her lover Anthony fell on his own sword, but Cleopatra, she just poked herself. She barely lost blood. Now, as a young in, we have to note that Cleopatra was brilliant. She was also interested in learning specifically about chemistry. So this theory about her poisoning herself doesn't sound very far-fetched. Until we find her body, we'll really never know.